This is a workshop in the series of those that were conducted by the first edition of the EU Blockchain Observatorium Forum, and now the second one for the second new edition of the Observatorium Forum. It's a very important one. It's one at the heart of the global digital economy and Europe's industrial policy for moving into the era of the decentralized converging technologies. And these we see as blockchain, AI, big data, internet of things, leading to manufacturing 4.0, but more generally digital economy and society 4.0, if you wish to put a number on it. We have a great set of speakers today globally, which is also something while of course we're concerned with Europe's recovery and resilience building our own European blockchain services infrastructure with use cases which could benefit, for instance, from a digital euro if such were introduced. We are also global and multilateralist by definition. So working today with the Bank of Japan, with the Bank of Canada, with industrial players from all over the world, with academia from MIT, this is the excellent way forward for the EU Blockchain Observatory and Forum, which also reflects the approach of the European Commission. Other things to look forward to, which will coincide and hopefully have synergies with the direction towards central bank digital currencies, if such are chosen by the central banks present here today and others, are the European Blockchain Partnerships Regulatory Sandbox, looking also how to implement types of tokenization and smart contracts, as well as the blockchain services infrastructure. The current digital finance package, which has been adopted by the European Commission and is proposed to the council, the member states and the European Parliament for adoption, including the markets in crypto assets and the pilot regime, a more than regulatory sandbox for market infrastructures, which may use distributed ledger technologies and then actually can have regulatory requirements in that environment lifted. You also have the accompanying uh, legislation on cybersecurity, the so-called DORA on uh, resilience in the financial sector. And upcoming, we have the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act. The Digital Services Act, which is an updating of e-commerce, will probably address smart contracts, which many of you may have noticed were in the public consultation. So finishing up, this is our holistic, international, but of course also European view. So I'm looking very much forward to hearing from not only the European Central Bank, but the Bank of Japan, the Bank of Canada, and the other international and European players today. Speaking after me will be Mark Tavener, uh, Executive Director of the International Association of Trusted Blockchain Applications. And then we have uh, benefited from the services of some really impressive mo uh, moderators, uh, Dr. Nina Luisa Siedler from Inatba for the first session. For the second session, we'll have Monica Singer joining us from Consensus. And finally, from my own unit, uh, Lucas Repa, Dr. Lucas Repa, Doctor of Law, um, Senior Policy Officer and responsible for the legal team in our unit on digital innovation and blockchain. With that, I think we want to get right into the contents of the workshop. So I have the floor to, I have the pleasure to pass the floor to Mark Tavener, Executive Director of Inatba. Mark, the floor is yours. Federis, uh, many thanks and good morning, everybody. Uh, excuse me whilst I just adjust my camera a little. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. I hope you can all hear me very loudly. I just want to give you a few opening thoughts from Inatva's perspective before today's very significant and important round table. So I put it to you that central bank digital currencies are coming. And I draw reference to the BIS's annual study from published in January 2020, where 66 central banks who responded stated that 80% of them 
were focused on engaging in work around digital currencies, central bank digital currencies. This is up from the number 65% in 2017, so a significant uptick in the number of central banks engaging in work on digital currencies. And furthermore, they went on and stated, the 66 central banks, that the likelihood of them issuing central bank digital currencies was 10% of them within three years and 20% within six years. So that's a significant number that leads me to the statement or supports the statements that I put to you, which is that central bank digital currencies are coming. Indeed, if we look at individual countries, and I'll just call one out here, though there are many others, Switzerland intends to issue a form of central bank digital currency, or at least a project that will be supported by a central bank by the end of 2020 with their uh, initiative around XDX and the issuance of a stable coin, where the Swiss central bank intends to become a node or act as the, the backer, if you will, to remove any counterparty risk from the issuance of that particular stable coin. So everything points to the emergence and the existence of central bank digital currencies, maybe sooner than we think. And I just wanted to, to reflect a few moments on the motives for that. Clearly, it's financial stability. Uh, some would argue at the very heart of the reason for everybody considering central bank digital currencies at the moment is financial stability and leading on from that monetary policy. But also uh, a vast and very strong focus on the efficiency of payments the reduction in costs, the reduction in friction, and uh, to a certain extent, dependent on the country that you're in, an inclusiveness, a desire to make sure that innovation can include all members of society. And of course, the maintenance of safety and security when it comes to payments. From an Atmos perspective, we see push and pull as it comes to the topic of central bank digital currencies. Firstly, from a push perspective, uh, and I would proffer you the, 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 the naming convention here surrounding the push is the traditional financial systems, where we see typically, with the exception of a few countries, the use of cash declining and digitization increasing. That has, I think, been amplified and accelerated because of certain global trends, not least of which is the current pandemic that we sadly find ourselves all in, but also the focus on costs. Many of us who have access to digital banking are very mindful of costs. And this leads on to an examination around what is the role of a central bank as we look to the future, as we look to the new normal, as the use of cash declines, as digitization increases. So this is the push and some of the considerations when I talk to members of our government advisory body, for example, around what they're thinking are issues around security, both of individuals within their countries, of the institutions that make up the banking system, and frankly, of the countries themselves and their stability, their ability to draw down on monetary policy and thereby maintain financial stability and also considerations of sovereignty. The pull comes from innovation, uh, and we offer this thought to you from an Atmos perspective, that there is a huge amount of innovation that is allowing faster access to oh, access to faster payments, payments that have less friction, that have lower costs, that are more flexible, and we would offer a more in keeping with what users, what citizens, what global citizens are demanding. Micropayments themselves draw on the ability of technology to support uh, certain consumption of content such as films, music, or games and in-game purchases, where the purchase levels are very low, they need to be almost instant, and they have to be done in a, in a very frictionless and very low cost way. So this innovation is pulling users towards new applications, not least of which is the potential for the Internet of Things, the development of AI, blockchain, big data, and other technologies that Pederas referred to that will represent society or industry 4.0. And we're seeing this in a prevalence of wallets on devices such as mobile phones, but also other devices which are technology-based and to a certain extent have the ability to execute auto payments or to run smart contracts. So within this, this pull, we see technology and the opportunity for innovation capturing the imagination of populations 
and representing somewhat of a challenge to the traditional financial systems who want to maintain security, they want to protect their individuals, they want to respect their institutions and they need to maintain access to monetary policy. So to fi finish up with my thoughts from Inapa's perspective before I pass over to my fellow board member, Nina Siedler, to kick off the discussions today, Inapa is calling for practical policy analysis and robust technical testing that allow us to explore the role of central banks as they evolve and most naturally will evolve, but not at the cost of discounting the opportunity for innovation, both at a technical and a structural level, where we can reimagine the future and deliver to our citizens, to our society, and to our industries, opportunities to innovate, to advance, and to create value. So thank you very much again for listening to me this morning, to the European Observatory and Forum for giving me the floor. And with that, Nina, I hand it over to you to lead the moderation of the first session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. I think that uh, perfectly set the frame for the panel to come. Um, I'm happy to moderate the first session, which is on use cases for programmable money in the economy. Uh, I am, uh, alongside of being a board member of INATBA, partner at DWF, a technology-oriented global law firm, and head the International Blockchain Competence Group there and focus in my daily work on the legal implications of blockchain and distributed ledger technology projects. Um, I had been in, involved in the discussion around CBDC for quite a while now um, and also supported the open letter, which have been drafted by a number of industry participants and published by Professor Philip Sandler earlier this year, um, the link of which I will put in the chat during the session for your information. Um, I'm very grateful for having a number of highly knowledgeable speakers today during this session who will present their respective use cases in the following order. First of all, um, uh, the start will be made by Ricky Lamberti from Bosch, uh, then followed by Etienne Geheim from Engie, uh, Helge Königs from Daimler and Maximilian Forster from Cash on Ledger. I will introduce them one on one immediately prior to giving them the floor to their respective presentation. So let me start with uh, Ricky Lamberti from Bosch. Um, Ricky has been researching uh, and doing his doctorate at the University of Basel since 2019, focusing on crypto economic primitives as building blocks for the digital socio economy. Since 2018 already, he has been contributing his knowledge to the strategic advanced development project Economy of Things, EOT, at Bosch as an expert in tokenomics and digital payment. I am happy to. Please, um, uh, Ricky, take over the floor. So thank you, Nina, for this introduction. I will try to share my screen. So can everybody see my screen? And do you hear me because I can't hear you now? Yes, anymore? yes, we hear Perfect. you and okay. we can see your screen. Thank you. Super. Okay, so first of all, I, I would like to say thank you and I'm happy to be here today. Um, my name is Ricky Lamberti, as also said, I'm 20 years old and 28 years old. And um, I think that the whole topic around the digital programmable Euro and the digital economy uh, is a tremendous opportunity for Europe. Um, I would like to start with uh, some key figures about uh, the company. Um, what I would like to, you to know is that we have like four different business units and we're currently at, um, in the shape towards a IoT company where we want to focus on software sensors and services and uh, we want to shape uh, the area of the digitized economy in a more fair and sustainable way by using here blockchain or decentralized technologies which I'm going to talk about in the next slides. So before we start to have a deep dive into the use cases, I would like to say something about the rise of the digital um, economy, which is, uh, in my uh, my opinion, um, much more than a digital euro. 
Um, so what we see right now is that the European and global economy is moving rapidly towards a digital socio economy and socio in the meanings of society and not of social compared to communism. Um, the web 2.0, which was characterized by the functional by the functionality which was fundamentally provided centralized. Um, and most of the contributions required to generate the value is supplied by a large number of users. We have their Facebook, Instagram, to name a few, which we see that network effects and information asymmetry brings a powerful tech guidance, which we declare as too big to fail. And central intermediaries and monopolists are a result that enter more and more our traditional markets. We can see this with Amazon, Google, Tencent, and other um, companies like those. Um, what we have seen now with the rise of uh, Bitcoin and Nokamoto to the Web 3.0 movement, we try to seek and overcome this centralized and imbalanced information asymmetry to build a more fair and digital socio economy. And based on what is known as distributed ledger technology, uh, brought up or distributed ledger technology brought up a scientifically, economically, and socially relevant field. And um, we think that this. Uh, Part of or this this technology to uh, to questioning this uh, the way of equal social coordination in a in a, in the digital economy um, is a huge chance. By linking the scientific areas of game theory, mechanism design, and cryptography, it has been possible to develop a secure and more efficient digital economy. And uh, this is also referred as the democratized web or web 3.0 where we have those decentralized infrastructures. And in this way, uh, Europe has an opportunity to mold a digital socio-economy, which can be based on European values in such a way that efficiency can be enhanced and that the threat of this uh, penetration of those destructive um, monopolistic structures or actors uh, can be counteracted. If you want to read out about more about that, you can find lots of this uh, uh, basic research about this whole topic on our website. So uh, to get in, um, this digital economy has we required or we identified four key, uh, key building blocks. We have like uh, fair temper resistant B two B marketplaces where we say like a user and a consumer need to get together. They need to be a matchmaking in a fair and sustainable way. We have like the building block two, where we say like it's compliant, secure, efficient payment systems, which we're gonna talk about today. And um, we also have secure digital identities. And as a layer to organize and to structure everything, we say that there need to be organizational structures and incentive systems for, tocal, uh, for digital ecosystems. Incentive systems are often referred as tokenomics. Um, what we see is again, as um, Mark mentioned in the introduction, um, we see that uh, DLT will serve as a big backbone to proprietary platforms since it, uh, since it has advantages concerning power concentration or information asymmetry. And um, now we see that, uh, oh, sorry, uh, <laughs> the digital value representation and programmable efficient uh, value transactions are now uh, the focus on my next use cases. I brought up two use cases from the mobility and infrastructure, uh, one use case from the mobility and infrastructure side and one from the industry um, side. So what we have here, I just illustrated it in a short way that we have like a parking provider, we have a DLT network and we have a car. And um, first of all, the parking provider um, registrates a decentralized identity in a DLT network. Uh, secondly, we say that there needs to be like some side of a trusted um, party that verifies this decentralized identity. Again, here we say that there are multiple opportunities. This is not one company that does this. Um, we uh, can see then that this would be a discovery agent crawling this DLT network and crawls for identity parking providers. And those parking providers can either be private persons or companies. Um, if we then have a car as a user that uh, tries to find a parking lot somewhere, uh, ask the parking agent, the discovery agent for the information. As soon as uh, the information is sent to the car where a fitting parking provider would be, um, the car and the parking provider are negotiating the conditions. Um, and at the end, um, the car just leaves the parking lot and pays 
parking fees via DLT or directly to the provider. What you see here is that um, we have an end-to-end -end relation. We have different multiple parking providers uh, from different offers. We have different multiple car providers. And um, what is now required is an interoperable means of payment and a standardized means of payment. And ideally, um, we seek uh, the word of programmable money here because um, we think that money could then right now in this, such a use case be directly distributed between the parking lot operator, the electricity supplier and other service provision that takes place on the parking lot. So this one use case from the mobility side. And um, we also identified like four key um, phases of such an interaction. It's always about discovery, how to find persons. Um, that's what takes place in the marketplace. We have um, the meeting of the minds where we have like those, uh, those agents um, negotiate and auction about the price. And uh, we have the settlement, of course, where we have the contract execution and the payment, um, mostly on us or people speak here a lot of uh, the case of uh, smart contracts. And uh, after the settlement, we have the post settlement about reputation or something. So these are the four building phases or the four phases that we can see in almost every digital um, interaction, business interaction. One use case from the connected industry or to, to, to get an idea what the connected industry 4.0 can look like. So what we see here is again, like the emergence of decentralized platforms. And uh, this is then a federated system governed by multiple entities. And um, what we already right now see, in my opinion, is that the, the opportunities for programmable money or for payments is endlessly. Um, we have new billing models like paper use, for example. Um, machines could uh, track the products via sensors. We have automation through smart contracts. We have incentivization to behave correctly and um, to offer all of this. Uh, or because of this, most of this data information is probably in a frictional sand area. Uh, we also say that there needs to be, or there could be like um, micropayments, a lot of micropayments occurring in such an environment due to um, paying for some machine uh, data or sensor data. And um, a question here, or, or what comes up then is like, how do those machines and, 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 and companies uh, then pay themselves? And this is probably the same use case uh, for uh, the same problem for any use case. If we have a decentralized data marketplace, a decentralized manufacturing place, energy platform, um, that we need uh, a fitting payment solution. And currently we have limitations for the adoption of DLT. In this regard, that uh, the current DLT operable means of payment um, have several drawbacks. So we have cryptocurrency payments, they suffer from huge volatility. Um, or, yeah, uh, stable coin payments that are possible, but currently in the gray zone and due to not really being regulated. If we have a look on Tether or maybe also Libra to mention here. And uh, third point would be e-money token payments that are possible, but these are limited to private permissioned networks. And here it gets clear that we need awareness for an interoperable payment system. Um, in the last uh, month, there was also the idea of coming up with a trigger solution, which I have not mentioned now as a fourth point, but there would be also be the way to, to bridge the existing financial system with the, uh, with the DLT networks or with different DLT networks. But again, we have like media breaks or discontinuity. So um, ideally we would have on the ledger the programmable euro here to fully realize the potential of this digital economy. Um, like I said, uh, no interoper interoperable regulated programmable euro equivalent exists. And uh, beneath or uh, beside the fact that we don't have now a fitting payment solution, um, we currently see that the industries, the European industries are at risk. We see that powerful players uh, there to establish uh, dominant positions in this context, like payment service providers or private nations, nation state based uh, currencies um, that, uh, that uh, come up now, providing a currency to the industry or to the users. Um, like I said, web uh, 2.0 tech icons extending their dominant positions and also like foreign nation states. 
um, to say one or to name one China. Um, and this is bad due to the fact that those uh, those uh, centralized in, uh, intermediaries or powerful intermediaries extract business and rele relevant business information, and based on these dominant centralized positions, um, they put the industries, the European key industries, at risk, and also the banking sector to mention here. And um, this would have like several drawbacks, not only from uh, getting information asymmetry about European economy, it's also about subverting or tr trying to subvert uh, the sovereignty and hence effectivity of monetary policies. But I think this will be um, more in the discussion of the rounds later. So to sum up, um, I would like to say that the digital economy is uh, inevitable coming. It's on the rise and it will be based on those decentralized technologies. We have seen this, I mean, current uh, DLT operable payment solutions have uh, different drawbacks, as I mentioned, like volatility or not being regulated uh, as it has to be for a company. Uh, for, for a company. And um, the, 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 the missing current, the, the, the there's currently no interoperable means of payment in place um, and provides uh, huge opportunities for those tech against and other nation states uh, to put uh, the European key industries at risk. And um, so we see this whole topic about programmable money is now in a full swing. And uh, also the position from the central banks have changed over the last one year, it says. Um, so I'm, 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 I'm really looking positive into the future and hope that we find here um, a fitting payment solution because the European requ uh, economy requires this programmable euro equivalent allowing smart contract execution while complying with regulatory requirements. And um, again, I want to, um, uh, to, to just to point out that this is a huge opportunity for, um, for Europe and um, that uh, we have the chance now to, 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 to here to, to build counterparts, decentralized counterparts that can't, uh, can't, uh, can, can uh, handle uh, those um, centralized big tech guidance that are now coming on the European market. So, um, this to say, um, I want to thank you. Um, and um, in the corner of the presentation, you see a QR code, which you can scan now or make a photo if you want to, to end up on the, our research site to find more about this and to get more in-depth view about um, the statements that have been made now in this presentation. Um, thank you very much and looking forward for the discussion later on. Many thanks, Ricky. Um, much appreciated. And uh, the discussion already started. If you could uh, check the Q&A um, box, um, I think there are a number of questions already addressing you personally with further questions around the presented use case. Um, having said that, I would like to turn to our second speaker, Mr. Etienne Geheim from NG. Etienne holds a PhD in electrochemistry and spent more than 18 years in research and development at NG, studying decentralized energy resources, starting with fuels, cells, and batteries. Since January 2018, he is NG Digital Innovation Office, Officer and in charge of bringing digital technologies to the business units of the whole group. In addition to being a board member of various startups, um, I'd like to mention Rockside, Archipels, Tyco Energy, he was appointed founding council member of the Energy Web Foundation in 2018. Welcome, Etienne. We look forward to your use case. Thank you very much, Nina, and thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm really glad to contribute to this uh, uh, workshop. I'm going to share my screen as well. And you should see now my first slide of my presentation. Is that all right? 
Yes, we do see it. Okay, thank you very much. So, <clears throat> um, I'm going to uh, show you a use case uh, uh, dealing with energy communities uh, uh, that um, allowed us to explore the possibilities of creating a, a currency uh, used in those uh, uh, communities, for instance. But um, just a few words about Engie. If some of you don't know us, uh, we are an energy company um, and we really want to accelerate the transition towards uh, 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 carbon neutral economy, uh, not only for ourselves, but also for our clients. So we tend to help our clients uh, achieve their own uh, carbon neutral uh, goals as quickly as possible. And just to give you an idea of, uh, of the size, uh, we, we have about uh, 170,000 uh, employees working all around the world. Um, we transport energy mostly by gas, but also a little bit uh, uh, in electricity. But essentially, we generate uh, electricity more and more renewable, and we retail that e electricity uh, to B two C customers and uh, also B two B. And and the the whole shift uh, towards uh, zero carbon is really uh, provided uh, through services. So. Uh, I will piggyback on all the good explanation provided by Ricky and go straight into the use case I wanted to uh, address, which is energy communities. And as some of you might know, there are a lot of different flavors of uh, energy community, but um, we explored the possibility to share and exchange the value created within an energy community, starting with uh, the crowdfunding uh, issue, uh, meaning the investment by individuals alongside with us, NG, uh, in the, uh, the assets that the energy community would uh, draw upon, for instance, PV panels, uh, uh, and uh, the reward from that investment uh, being shared through uh, uh, an internal currency uh, used in that energy community. This uh, use case was in fact explored already four years ago, even five years, uh, uh, starting in 2015 uh, in the context of a, a Sunseed FP7 uh, R&D project funded by the European Commission. Uh, and and therefore, at the time, we used the Ethereum uh, blockchain uh, to create a, a, a coin that we called the Sunji because uh, we found it uh, fun <laughs> to associate the, the, the sun and our NG name. Uh, but basically, what uh, 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 it was used for was to uh, create um, customer. Um, adoption and customer loyalty through a currency that, di that was directly derived uh, from uh, the, the production of uh, the assets into which the member of the, Euro the energy community had invested. So basically a member of the community would receive uh, a number of Sanji corresponding to the production of the PV assets in which they invested. And uh, those Sanji could be either exchanged between themselves or redeemed uh, at NG for any other purchase, uh, such as uh, uh, energy as, uh, itself or other services, but as well as uh, uh, redeemed at uh, uh, partners. Uh, within the NG uh, ecosystem. Um, at the time, we we did this uh, proof of concept totally technically. It was never commercialized, uh, put into uh, a, a real uh, uh, production. But uh, all the technical components that uh, were available to us uh, five years ago uh, uh, worked. Uh, and that included a uh, partnership with Gemalto, who provided at the time the uh, secure element to uh, secure the identity of the assets 
and uh, uh, secure the uh, 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 the measurements uh, that were done on the production of those assets. Why did we want to uh, introduce a currency? Well, uh, because as I said, it could be redeemed within uh, uh, an ecosystem, but it could also be programmable. That means if member of the energy community would sell their investment, the initial investment in, into the assets or wanted to buy further uh, uh, into those assets, their reward in Sanji would have been auto automatically uh, adjusted. Uh, without any intervention and therefore at a very low cost of management uh, for, for us. Um, and, and of course, uh, uh, that could uh, be extended to, to any other uh, automatic service uh, that uh, could be provided through a smart contract. And, and there were additional uh, benefits of doing this, uh, uh, for instance, being able to provide guarantees of origin uh, of the uh, local production uh, on a continuous uh, uh, pace, uh, as opposed to the uh, uh, the, the usual uh, 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 system, which is uh, yearly based, uh, essentially. So. Um, as I said, this internal currency was uh, an advantage to mostly create uh, customer loyalty uh, towards our uh, um, uh, offerings and services, but it has, a, um, of course, a, a drawback. Uh, and, and even if uh, NG is a large company and well-known and hopefully trusted, uh, it might be a little bit uh, uh, a worrying uh, that uh, the, the, the Sanji value could uh, fluctuate with respect to fiat currencies, for instance. Uh, and therefore, it could be created as a stable coin, but uh, it could be advantageously uh, pegged to the uh, a European uh, central bank uh, digital currency, because that would bring much more trust uh, and uh, uh, much more stability um, than a, a simple stable coin. So uh, that's, that's the first thing. It would be advantageous for us as well to choose uh, uh, this solution if uh, we would keep the uh, advantages uh, of the, uh, let's say, private coin in terms of management of um, the ancillary services uh, uh, of, of that uh, currency with respect to, to our clients or the, the participants of the energy community. <clears throat> and of course, this has to be clarified, I guess, uh, still. Um, but we could imagine that uh, within a, a restricted uh, field of activity and being therefore regulated to a certain extent, we, we could be allowed to manage wallets or uh, uh, KYC or AML uh, checks and, and, and maybe even a, a custody service uh, as well, for instance. Otherwise, uh, we would rely on a third party uh, uh, classical uh, uh, provider and, uh, and therefore would be less uh, uh, useful to us. Uh, but in a nutshell, and to be quite short, uh, we believe that uh, such a use case would be advantageously uh, improved if a CBDC uh, could be provided on conditions, uh, as I said, that uh, private um, approved institutions would be allowed to do some of the uh, um, ancillary services to be able to take a full advantage of, uh, of, of that programmable uh, currency. So with that, I will end now and uh, leave the floor to questions uh, or the further uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Yeah, many thanks um, for that and specifically for pointing out um, how important it is that um, the industry must be able to actually make use and, and deliver 
um, additional services surrounding such CBDC, which uh, seems to be um, maybe not quite in line with the currently proposed regulation on uh, crypto assets. So um, we should pick this up with um, our representatives from the European Commission later during the discussion. Yeah, we would like to ask everyone to post um, his or her questions in the Q&A box. Um, and we will pick some of these up during our panel discussion at the end of all presentations. And having said that, I would like to turn um, to Helge Königs from Daimler. Um, he is almost 20 years with Daimler, most of the time having worked for Daimler at CFO in China, Germany and France, and since 2016 with Daimler Trucks uh, in, uh, the, and driving the digital change of its uh, finance organization. Part of the change process is um, the Daimler truck wallet concept, which they started in 2019, um, and also M2M pay payment processes with Digital Europe. That and what they are heading for is part of his presentation. Um, and I would like to hand over the floor to him. Helge, please take over. Helge, you are still muted. Yeah, can you hear me now, Nina? Yes, yes, thank I you. I don't have a picture actually, I'm uh, stopped from that, but however, perhaps if you can see my screen already, is it working? Yes, we see your screen. Perfect, so yeah, thanks for the opportunity to uh, present um, one of our use cases, in particular when it comes to digital money. Um, as you said already, um, we are working on a project now for a couple of years we call the truck wallet with the basic idea that uh, machines and in our sense what we set up trucks and belonging to the truck division of Daimler, um, that machines will take over um, responsibilities and will become uh, economic agents. Um, what we do there is simply when it comes to, oh, wait a second, I receive, I can start my video. Here I am, sorry. So um, the vision uh, within Daimler Trucks is simply the truck uh, is an economic agent more and more. And what we can do about that is, and what we have to do about this is simply to equip the machine with an um, electronic ID. We heard about that already in the other presentations. That's a crucial device and uh, it has to be tempered proofed. It has to be integrated. It has to be standardized in a way. Um, but um, what we do in principle is that from Daimler truck side, we say, let's do these use cases to learn because we can do discussions uh, quite a long time about standardization. If you don't know how that is from an IT or programmer side really working, um, it does not really give substance to these kind of discussions. And so far, what we say and the core of what we do with our vehicles on the truck side is we equip them with a so-called truck wallet. That means they have an electronic ID and this ID enables the machine to do several kinds of transactions. Um, in particular, on the one hand, having a kind of machine to machine contracting, having um, really the initialization and the authentication of transactions and payments, which is uh, pretty important uh, in our opinion. And then finally, and that is only one aspect, but stores the data, validates it for the machine, which has done something. Um, we are started to building a platform for that. And um, our first use case, uh, or not only use case, the one we already also programmed, 
Um, what we love to do is simply to do that with partners, not to remain then principally in theory, but uh, we are not payment experts. We hope we are experts in trucks, but um, we are not really about payments itself. And so far, um, we teamed up with the colleagues from Commerzbank, the mining incubator, uh, to talk about payments, machine to machine payments. And we did that for the charging industry together with the Energy and Share and Charge Foundation. Um, simply with the um, POC, we programmed that an electronic truck and, and, or an, an e-truck, how we call it. And these uh, trucks will come in the near future. They are already here in some of the other ways. Um, that this machine can directly get in touch with uh, the charging station uh, it's negotiating uh, the terms and conditions plus uh, doing the entire transactions and paying for itself. Um, we assume that in general, um, all these kind of business models, which we see there um, as an option, um, might have classical payments in there. That means uh, things are paid as today, there is an invoice at the end of the month um, but a machine, in principle, can also initiate all kinds of payments. However, all kinds of payments, not to say that this is boring, but this is what we know. It's quite expensive, in our opinion. The customer really does not know that, that uh, there is a lot of money in there, which uh, yeah, participating parties charge uh, in our current payment procedures. And that was also one thing to say, we want to have a direct payment machine to machine um which which we then really do um why also then doing it with a digital euro we came out of the entire blockchain distributed ledger approach um, fascinated by cryptocurrencies and all kinds of technique or technical aspects behind but we simply learned also not only with our customers also looking at ourselves uh, we should not increase complexity and uh, our customers have to deal with enough currencies. They don't need another currency um, where they simply say, okay, what is it now? And what is the exchange rate I have to use? And what is the volatility? We heard the terms. We simply think a digital euro is something our customer and ourselves, we, we understand that. And uh, that is something which is necessary um, one item for us, uh, we should not increase this complexity. And the second thing why we went with the digital um, euro in our project was simply looking at, uh, and now our customers, but we have it all in general, the liquidity base is a pretty important aspect. And if I go and have to, in that way, exchange for so-called currencies, um, which I have to purchase and in my balance, they become assets. They are not liquidity anymore. This is something from a business perspective, the, uh, absolutely impossible. No logistics company would go for that. Does not make any sense if I change liquidity against assets um, and I'm really my weak liquidity basis, which is used for so many things, I weaken that even further. And so far, we went for a digital euro, we teamed up, as I said, with Commerzbank, and we also required, and that was one aspect for the digital euro, we required to say, um, we need to have something which, even if it does perhaps not exist today, is um, from a legal perspective, from a regulatory perspective, um, running in the near future. So uh, we cannot rely on, um, yeah, exotic laws with exotic uh, countries uh, we have to have a broad solution and uh, this is something which we preferred and we said okay let's try to do this and the colleagues from Commerzbank made a proposal we also get the the um, requirements in there that this is something which could be even approved the logic is quite simple. Finally, uh, there is the customer's account, the logistics company account. It's in euros. Exchanging that, giving a part of the euros, which is here in that case on his uh, company's account at Commerzbank, 
uh, exchanging that to digital euros, keeping his liquidity, and then the digital euros, they are transferred to the vehicle's wallets. So if you exchange 10,000 euros, for example, into digital euros, you take 2,000 for um, vehicle number one, and this vehicle can now, you can program that or not, can now use these digital euros for specific programmed items there. And for sure, the counterpart also has to have then the respective wallet to, in that terms, exchange its money back to the, um, what, what, what is then in his uh, current account of, uh, of the bank where he simply sees his liquidity or the situation of his balances. Um, the use case is then like that, and um, I just go uh, a little bit with speed over that. Uh, you initialize the um, electronic ID of your truck. Um, the truck then, or the, the fleet manager then uh, has the possibility, as I said that, to transfer the um, euros from the current company's account into digital euros. He's allocating that to different trucks, to different truck IDs. And in our use case, it was then, and this is something machine to machine sounds always very nice. Looking at that a little bit deeper, you see it's uh, machine to back end, to back end to machine, it's uh, machine to back end whatsoever. So it's, mm, we should not take in, in the future this term too serious. However, to us in this case, we wanted to do also the machine payment uh, M to M because um, one of the basic questions for us is what is the reputation of a machine? How can another machine understand uh, that there's money? And that was also one important aspect with the digitalization of the Euro. We wanted to learn about micropayments, uh, in particular, the data-driven approach here. What we mean there is we can increase the data processing of machines um, yeah, step by step, that's not a problem, but what we see, we are always limited. And so far, um, every kind of digitalization, in particular then money, micropayments, uh, that is data processing power consuming. And we need a technology or we are looking for technologies to reduce or for processes also, to limit that as much as possible, because even if we can increase the capacities of these machines, when it comes to data processing, it's always limited. There are so many requests from digitalization, whether it's automated driving or other issues, that you always have this kind of cap that you cannot really go beyond, even if in theory you can do everything in practice with uh, releases and everything you cannot. That is one of our major issues in there. So um, we learned a lot, but when it comes to payments and digital euros, um, here we, we conducted that together with uh, the Commerzbank colleagues with uh, the Corda software, Corda DLT. So uh, we think that it was already, and uh, it is already something which could be easily implemented. So we assume to be in that sense, legally compliant. Um, we put it in there, no crypto, because it's, um, as I said, it's interesting. It's uh, fascinating even, but um, it's exotic. It's a niche. Um, we simply don't believe into that for a broad purpose. Also M2M -M payment, um, as I said in the beginning, we assume payments to be expensive today as we handle that, as we do it, looking at who's earning in this entire process money. That's quite a lot. Um, so is an M2M -M payment, if a machine can pay another machine directly, is it cheaper? We assume yes, in the current stage without infrastructure for sure not, but uh, something which we definitely think we should go further with because um, yeah, finally, it's about efficiencies and economies and um, payment is um, looking at that in principle an expensive thing which we currently do.
Micropayments are possible, but as I put it already, the data processing part is very, very important. So what becomes micro looks suddenly that it's becoming quite huge, um, but it's important if you don't have, uh, in that sense, the ability or the, the possibility to look at the credit worthiness of a machine, um, then um, simply step-by-step -step payment um, is absolutely important because you can, uh, or it will be stopped, the, the transfer of, in that sense, what we did here with the uh, colleagues from, from Energy, uh, the charging stops immediately when there is no money in the wallet anymore. And that is something which replaces pretty much parts of looking at how is somebody credit worthy? What do I need as data from a machine to yeah, create a kind of trust? The light note concept, that's something when it comes really more and more to decentralization. Um, we learned that a lot of things are still centralized. Companies would love to keep their legacy systems. However, thinking about the automation of vehicles or trucks, um, we also have to be aware of the fact that with the automation, there is autonomy needed. And this autonomy is in a way decentralized. So um, it is important to us, can, can we really manage this decentralization from a technical point um, when we look at these things? So why are we pretty much in favor of uh, a digital euro? I think I tried to explain its simplicity and simplicity for us and our customers. So uh, an additional exchange rate we don't need. It's uh, only complex. Every company knows that. Um, it's you, you, you are taking risks and calculations. Don't do that. So keep it simple. Um, simply having a digital euro, that's it. Uh, to us, it's from a legal perspective, absolutely important. Um, there are institutions, supranational institutions regulating this currency. Um, we would be definitely afraid if something which is part of the basic infrastructure um, of how business is done is put into private hands. The accessibility goes hand in hand with that. Um, even if business is pretty much about being exclusive, paying prices for something, um, the question is, is that also valid for a currency? Is it uh, a way that we exclude participants uh, already by the construction of the concept? Uh, stability, we already heard that, uh, definitely uh, about all the volatility which is in other markets and the operability, that is what I also mentioned in the beginning, simply the point uh, that we have to be aware of um, the fact how is the financial structure of a company um, today organized and um, operability, we really mean the, not the interoperability now of, of coins or concepts. We simply mean that uh, cash is cash, liquidity is liquidity. And um, everything which changes this situation um, decides about the acceptance um, in the business world, in our customers' world, um, of, of a kind of digital currency. So that's what um, I wanted to state. And uh, yeah, I hope it was um, understandable and OK. Many thanks, uh, Helga. I think actually you made it crystal clear why a CBDC would make a difference to you. Many thanks for that. Um, I think um, you thereby explained also a number of questions which had been raised in the chat, but I invite you to take a look at the questions directed specifically at you um, in the chat while we move on to our next speaker. And then after um, that next presentation, we will actually pick up questions from the Q&A box. But um, please excuse um, Mr. Serkan Katim is had not been able to join us, but uh, he is perfectly replaced by his co-founder Maximilian Forster. Um, he is the CBDO and co-founder of Cash, Cash on Ledger Technologies GmbH. 
and he is involved in a high number of um, pressing initiatives, like member of the Digital Finance Working Group from the Germany's Economic Council, member of the Payments Working Group and Blockchain Working Group at Bitcom. Um, he co-founded uh, Blockchain Bayern and serves as private uh, sector expert and public speaker for FATF as well as for the European Commission and Parliament and uh, was with KPMG and Accenture prior to founding Cash on Ledger, uh, where he worked as technology investment expert uh, as well as Picos Capital. He has contributed to a vast number of highly relevant publications, and I am sure you will join me in welcoming him to the presentation of the use case that he had been working on. Max, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Nina. I'm uh, sharing my screen right now. It'd be perfect if you can just uh, name me if you can see it in full screen. Should be yes, there right now. Yes, we hear you and see you. All right, perfect. Well, uh, thanks a lot for the introduction, uh, Nina, and I'm very delighted actually to be here today to speak to you. Um, as well, like maybe a few words about Cash and Ledger. Cash and Ledger is a startup uh, 2019 co-founded or founded in Cologne. What we are doing is uh, basically focusing on uh, paper use cases. So the aforementioned, uh, very key aforementioned case paper use is uh, something which we took on and uh, we tried to um, definitely bring to um, the case and to the market. Actually, um, before starting uh, into the presentation, I would all of you urge to um, do something which is, I think, in that times and for the call, um, kind of, um, kind of, um, yeah, I would say, uh, um, reflecting uh, in that sense. That I would say, um, kill the word blockchain and kill the word um, programmable currency out of your mind. And I will try to make you basically make you use or make you take the view from um, a client who is actually basically using paper use and who is then also wanting to basically create programmable currencies. In that sense, um, starting the discussion, uh, what we have been doing is um, we are working together with Lindner tractors from Austria. To give a little bit more information about Lindner, Lindner is an SME in a classical sense. So they produce about uh, 1,600 uh, vehicles per year and uh, they have uh, 400 employees all stored and all basically employed in Austria. And they're in a highly competitive space in the farm machine new market. Lindner might not be very known, but uh, some of you might know Fendt, some of you might know the big players like Klaas, like um, basically uh, New Holland and all of the farm machinery companies. So Lindner came to us with a very specific uh, problem and a very specific challenge which they wanted to resolve. As the market is that competitive, um, Lindner needed to establish their own strategic position, which they found in actually leasing or renting out the vehicles. So basically, they have been um, so far in charge of uh, basically supplying the, the local markets, and by the local market, it's Austria, Germany, and France, with uh, rentable trucks and rentable tractors um, instead of just buying it. So basically, um, they wanted to offer their customers instead of like having long bound capital expenditure, they want to increase the operational expenditure from the customer to actually enable short term renting. And in order to do so, they obviously um, enter a market segment which has not been uh, so far um, played or played to a vast extent, and uh, they basically have the unique selling proposition throughout that. Um, doing so, um, basically Lindner uh, came up with the concept of paper use. So um, they evaluated that it's not only worthwhile to uh, basically rent the tractors, because in comparison to a car sharing model, a tractor can be used for a variety of reasons. So if you uh, imagine yourself sitting on a tractor in a steep uh, volatile um, hill with about 60 degrees, it's obviously a different kind of depre depreciation from the asset because it's more heavier used than if you just use it for uh, transport from um, yeah, location A to location B. So basically also if you have any kind of like assets basically stimulated or being built on the tractor as for example, like any kind of container, which is in the back or in the front. Um, this is something which is really like, you know, depreciating, uh, depreciating the asset. So basically you need to take that into consideration once you basically rent out the tractor on an hourly basis. So all of this information basically um, led to uh, the point that Lindner basically needed to recreate their uh, entire platform and basically made them face the following points. Like if you wanna enable this paper use case, they, um, has, they have to face several challenges. To name, the, uh, to name it beforehand, uh, Lindner is quite um, 
extend it in a way that they can track data and telemetric data. But what they need to face is high operating costs in manual process management. So the sales process is still manually. So the customer calls them directly in the office, as well as the contract management and closing. All of that obviously can be um, can be uh, also done by any kind of digital platform today. So any kind of like um, platform which you will implement, um, such as Sixth, will basically uh, take that part. But then we start basically by um, not having a good platform assessing, first of all, insurance. So basically uh, what they do is currently taking the whole plant insurance and stuff like literally having a micro insurance um, based on the data, as well as the vehicle logistics and asset management is a huge topic. I just mentioned the depreciation from the asset um, makes, uh, needs to be considered. So the different use cases for the tractor itself need to be considered and need to be differently charged as well as the transaction settlement, which needs to be automated because if you don't automate it, you need to basically deploy a huge accounting department. And that is what actually happened at Lindner. So they tried to basically rent out the tractors on traditional ways. They also implemented it on the website. They right now actually um, basically hide it on the website even that um, the, the people can't really use it because the process in the back end, uh, basically the costs scale faster then actually the turnover from the uh, tractors and from the renting industry. And that is something which we took on as a challenge. And that is something um, where we basically wanted to provide a solution, which we did with a variety of partners, because as said, what we need to do here is basically providing an end-to-end -end solution for, and uh, Helge Königs just mentioned it, for end-to-end -end payments in that sense, or in that sense, literally IoT payments. So basically starting by the telemetric unit in the tractor, basically something which is just creating data. We need to fetch this data. We need to secure that the data which is actually created is basically worthwhile of um, doing like any kind of uh, automated payments in the backend. So we need to secure and have an IT security or IT, uh, IT hardware security layer. We work together with Infineon to basically ensure that the data which is created at the very like use of the vehicle is actually the truthful data and the single source of truth in that sense. So after that, um, basically what we do is basically sorting it into any kind of invoicing or billing logic. So any kind of uh, payment function, which could be kilograms, which could be hours, which could be basically anything, is then implemented by ourselves, um, as well as we integrate it into the leading ERP systems, currently doing it for Infor, but um, due to an XML, basically uh, um, extraction can be integrated in any kind of platform. Uh, ERP platform, as well as we create uh, legally compliant, super compliant, um, basically invoice. So that's something which we create. So we basically orchestrate the invoice and the payment. And then uh, we basically directly give it to the partner from our from ours, uh, LBBW in Stuttgart, London's Bank von Wittenberg, who is basically settling um, the amounts and uh, the amounts basically created by the machine data extraction. So what we did is basically orchestrating the payments. We define the payment logic in the backend and then automatically transferring it to our partner who is then settling um, these invoices and forms of a payment directly and instant, instantly. So far, so good. Um, so far, this whole case could also be, um, and most of the bankers will now ask themselves like, okay, why are you using uh, central bank digital currency? Why do you need programmable currencies for that? You could also use like traditional CEPA transfers or the CEPA INS transfer. And I will come to that in a very second. But what is most important here is like, the third one and the play which I have not been uh, introduced, uh, which I have not introduced right now. And this is the insurance. So we so far only discussed about like basically Lindner as a company who is producing the tractors and the vehicles and then the client who is renting that. The point is that there is more parties to that system. And these more parties to that system actually require uh, a programmability and uh, basically a division and proper a proportional basically payment claim in the very end. Because if you right now take our uh, th third partner RNB insurance from Germany into that case, we basically have to follow in constellation. The client just wants to pay for the usage of the vehicles, simply saying he wants to pay the 10 euros uh, for his actual usage of the vehicle. Then we need to split the amount in the back end between the insurance company who wants to take its part because the insurance company does ensure if the machine breaks down, if you have any kind of like, Kind of contingency insurances everything is covered by them but obviously they want to be um be reimbursed for that and uh, this is like where we take an automated payment claim in the back end where the client pays the 10 euros eight euros go to directly to lindner who is the basically operator and then two euros go directly to rnv to basically ensure that throughout the usage of the vehicle the vehicle was insured and if it breaks down rnv basically um, takes the claim 
and uh, settles the amounts because none of them or not, neither the client nor the OEM, so Lindner can basically participate. And by already explaining it, you might get a feeling that it is very uh, crucial that you have in this multi-party system, basically a distinction between the several kind of payment methods and uh, between the several kind of payment claims. So acting in a um, basically unified system, blockchain in that sense, and now we can actually talk again about blockchain is a decentralized system or distributed ledger technology where it can rely upon. So basically the data we can store can be accessed by r and for insurance claims, as well as we use them for basically create payment claims and uh, basically transferring that then to uh, BBW and for, for the payment settlement. And for that, Initially, uh, a CBDC comes, or like a programmable money or digital euro basically comes into game because for the first time we can actually like then divide the payments automatically and by code, instead of just doing like two separate CPA transfers and the client needs to basically settle two different amounts currently. If you have a little bit more, a deeper look into the payment options, um, we basically have two things to consider. CIPA INST and instant credit transfer is a system which was implemented two years ago and basically creates I would say or resolves the issue of like instant payment settlements. So there's automatic uh, claims, there's automatic uh, basically clearing houses with taking care of like basically instant or almost real time within some 10 seconds uh, payment claims. But there is significant disadvantages in comparison to a digital euro. And these disadvantages basically result mostly for uh, the setup which was chosen. If you have a look at it, both of uh, the systems, so digital euro or a CIPA instant credit transfer will basically need a 24-7, 365 degree operational, as well as like core banking adoptions, and both of that system stay the same. But first of all, digital or programmable euro can directly be implemented by the bank into the client system. So in our case from Lindner, um, LBBW or any kind of other bank, which we're currently talking to, can basically reclaim um, more active status in transaction settlements. Um, versus at the CPA INST level, we basically need, again, a PSP, so a payment service provider, who is actually taking the offer into the market. So comparing that to from a banking perspective, you have with the CPA INST, you have the operational costs, you have the investment cost of updating your core banking um, system, basically to allow direct in, uh, trigger payments, to then basically only give that right to a payment service provider, such as any kind of fintech, or even like, you know, kind of the, the typical champions like Visa, MasterCard, or any anybody else who is then having another functionality where you have the cost and you have to bear the costs and you can't really like you know raise much costs uh, to the client so that's one of the major disadvantages versus a digital euro where the bank itself can basically reclaim a um, significant role particularly in the corporate payments sector because corporate payments is something where there was not much innovation in the last years we've basically almost focused on b2c so we've always been focusing on kind of the clarness of this world and the transfer wises but you haven't really focused on the corporate payments. And in order to really establish, as just said, the paper use case with its full blown uh, capacity, you will basically need a um, kind of, um, I would say, a programmable currency. And that sense, who can uh, um, basically fulfill several roles. And uh, programmability is one of them, instant settlement, the other one. And basically decide just between if you want to have like, you know, an implementation, just taking care of the instant settlement function versus a programmability plus a real-time and instant settlement function. Some of you might ask, that is nice theory, but what do you actually propose? And, and what we're actually using, as said, we are interoperable, so we can also use the SEPA instant network as well as we can just use programmable payments. But what we would propose in the short term is, due to the aforementioned uh, from Ricky, the, the global like exposure, that we have the FAT and we have Libra, we're like, working together on that end um, with, um, in the US. So you basically have a solution coming from that end, as well as you have China with uh, the digital yuan, um, basically fostering Europe into a position that there needs to be a um, there needs to be a very sharp and a very uh, short time solution, and uh, taking that into consideration, basically a short term solution from our perspective could be replacing commercial bank money at the current stage. So basically issuing DLT based commercial bank money because that comes from the private sector. It's a private sector innovation. The private sector basically can push that forward. There is discussions there. Um, they can simply just add, I would say the programmability as a function to our current commercial bank money and basically just putting them on another standard. I know that sounds very simple and there is more to it, but um, looking at all the other options which you currently have in the global race around the digital money, I think 
using that in a short-term solution to then basically gain more time to really work on a CBDC, which comes within, I would say, like the next years or maybe even like five to 10 years, I would say we need to have a short-term solution to prepare our businesses and SMEs to basically being equipped with a new kind of yeah, infrastructure, payment infrastructure and frictionless payments, which can automatically be integrated and enables new business models for them. Because ultimately we do this for our businesses, which are in Europe. So we mustn't really take care about like uh, any kind of um, functionality, which could be offered by any kind of B2C platform. Um, but we need to really literally give them the tools that they can create new business models, such as paper use, which is heavily reliant on that business case. And I'm uh, happy to share more about that later on. Nevertheless, um, I would, uh, I would or we propose basically the DLT based commercial bank money. We are in talks there with um, our partner. So with LBBW, there is uh, basically the first uh, kind of sections how it could work and how it could work is as follows. And uh, really just bringing it here from a high level perspective, what happens is basically once you imagine yourself like entering the tractor, so basically log in with your credentials then you stop using it after a while. So you get a bill of 10 euros. Um, you have the account at, for example, in that case, the LBBW, um, you basically, the LBBW fetches that. So you basically have a payment claim, which is created, payment claim from Linton against you. Um, LBBW takes that from your current bank account, wraps that up in an ESE um, 721 non-fungible token and presents this token to Linton, who can then basically settle this amount directly and gets uh, basically paid in, um, yeah, in just traditional SEPA bank transfer money. What I want to use with that is instead of uh, e-money, we created directly like a kind of payment claim in that sense. And this payment claim can directly be resolved once the standards and uh, this payment adapter technology, what we present here is adapted on a broad scale. Obviously we have uh, more scalability and uh, we can uh, basically take that into current consideration as like a kind of a standard. And obviously it needs to be a standard between the banks, but um, the banks basically need to uh, focus and need to, need to clarify for themselves how we can actually create, a, um, as would say, a scalable system. Because if you have a look at um, electronic money and uh, basically the, the current uh, rich, uh, restrictions of electronic money, I would say that we need to have a DLT based commercial bank money to have an interoperable standard and basically create the first use cases on top of it as we just presented. So digitizing the payment claim is a first kind of a, 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 a step towards that. Obviously, once you have a bank interoperability, that like a token which is issued by LBW is the same word as a token which is issued by a commerce bank or Deutsche Bank or any kind of other bank. This could be then potentially uh, revived into something where we can create uh, a digital euro for fungibility and standardization. And uh, with that, basically, you can create a um, new kind of uh, new kind of payment standard. Having said that, there was a lot of information. I hope uh, I made clear. Uh, what we've been doing with Lindner, why we actually need a programmable currency, why we actually want to have and want to uh, foster like the um, yeah, implementation of a euro, not cryptocurrencies, but a euro, which is programmable for real life use cases and basically to equip our industry players and our corporate players to uh, create new business models on the several kind of uh, blockchain platforms. And with that, I would like to close and give back to Nina. Thank you very much, uh, Max. I think also that uh, had been very valuable explaining um, what you had been building on and uh, looking for. I would like to thank all four uh, speakers we heard in this session one, Ricky, Etienne, Helge and Max for sharing your analysis and, and thoughts on use cases for CBDC. I recognize that a number of questions had already um, been answered um, directly by some of the speakers um, present here. Uh, and I actually would like to pick up uh, one which came up just lately, which I believe is very important. How will CBDC ensure anonymity privacy for the end users? Um, I think that is, a, that is a good question because we have this conflict between our anti-money laundry counter-terrorist financing roles forcing us to uh, KYC and track every payment and the privacy regulation um, demanding for a careful use of data provided and um, by using digital money we will certainly produce even more data. Is anyone of the panelists having a view, an opinion about this conflict and how to potentially solve it?
Helge, Max, Etienne? Maybe to start with, I mean, this, uh, I think it's a general question you always need to pose. I mean, this is also a question which might be, might also take our current financial system on because, you know, we put trust in the banks and the banks basically create with that trust commercial bank money is created. So from that perspective, um, I would put privacy in the same bucket. And obviously it's a huge challenge, but it's only one of the uh, challenges which you need to face with a full blown, I would say, wholesale CBDC. So basically we all get accounts by the uh, European Central Bank solution. So, I mean, there's also like, you know, other risks which we are opposing. So what happens in case of bank runs? What happens in case that we all get access to directly the funds from the ECB and all of uh, these issues? So privacy is definitely one of one of the major concerns. I would say in terms of uh, in comparison to our current system, our current fiat money, I think um, in opposite to cash, like we have more stability because you have cryptographic measurements because blockchain and DLT is one of the favorable technologies for CBDC. So, I mean, it is to some extent in short, but obviously it needs to have more uh, um, more deep dive analysis on that end to really to ensure that we uh, comply with all the GBR compliance standards. Yeah, thank you, Max, um, for, for that view. Um, and, and another recurring topic in the questions is when do we actually expect that uh, the euro as CBDC will come into play. And um, I think, Max, you already made clear that there is still a, a lot of research and analysis to be done. Um, but other um, jurisdictions are moving ahead, right? So I guess we don't have that much time um, to finally come to, to a decision. Any view within the speakers on how long it might take if the um, European Central Bank ever decides to implement a CDC, how long that could take? I was yesterday already in a <clears throat> talk uh, from the Bitcom, a German blockchain association, and there was also Ulrich Binzel, uh, one of the speakers, and um, um, a speaker panelist uh, said or brought up the timeline of having uh, in scale like five to ten years for a CBDC to roll out in Europe. So until that, I think it's quite important, as Maximilian said, that we have like um, a solution for the short, medium term uh, until we have the CBDC, because the, from the industry side and also as Helge mentioned, the use cases are now uh, developed and are now like from the POC phase, uh, from the proof of concept phase going now to the MVP stage and uh, like are ready now to go live or in, in the next year. So uh, the industry would require such a payment method soon. I think the Bahamas uh, just went live after maybe two or three years of uh, technical preparation. So it's maybe a simpler case because it's only one country, <clears throat> but um, basically technically it takes a couple of years, I would say. All right, yeah, my, I think a couple of years is a very um, positive estimate. Um, yeah, what do you think about um, the other countries already implementing CBDCs, testing them, and maybe going um, live, even a larger uh, jurisdiction, but that one that you just mentioned soon? Um, is there any chance that one of you would pick up this foreign CBDC for their purposes, maybe, you know, hatching them in a traditional way against Euro, or doesn't that make any sense? I mean, obviously, from that perspective, like um, my, my major belief is that money is competition. Money will be competitive. And um, with that claim, I would say, like, you know, the urge for innovation in Europe is tremendous because it really doesn't make it doesn't matter in a globalized world. I mean, we're all sitting together today because of COVID. We're all sitting like, you know, on our, in front of our screens and we are like all basically all jurisdiction of the world are basically just uh, screening right now. So it doesn't really make much sense for us to literally try to be protective here because if another jurisdiction implements it faster than us, basically they create new business models. And in order to really keep up with that pace on digital currencies, which we currently like, you know, see and experience, we really need to keep up the pace and we really need to like see even short-term solutions, which might not be scalable in the first sense, but uh, or like might not be the perfect solution, but we need to start. We need to like really get into the per in the mindset where we say, we need to implement something now because we see what other jurisdictions do and what other jurisdictions currently are operating because we need to bear in mind china is doing it since six years they're doing six years of research on central bank digital currencies 
So we can't really keep up with that. Like no matter what we say, like they have six years of experience back uh, in their pocket. And with that in mind, like obviously if you have new protocols emerging and we have globalized companies anyhow, it just switches that innovation department from Germany couldn't take place in a new business model. But then it will be like the innovation department from China because it obviously is a subsidiary. And then they start basically correcting that. And what will happen is that once they launch like, you know, the digital one next year um, through, throughout the Olympia, like basically some of us, once once we're actually uh, able to, to travel there, um, besides the, the, the COVID uh, crisis, once we are able to travel there, some of our, our folks will basically take that digital currency back to us. And then we have the first touch point. And then it starts again, like the virus, it starts to basically take place because everybody is saying, hey, look at the cool currency and you can't switch it. And that's, I think, one of the major points which you need to see. We can't really put a stop on the regulation or stop doing the regulation, but we need to keep up the pace and then keep working on solutions. Super comment, thank you. That's, uh, yeah, that's an interesting comment. Anyone else from the speakers who would like to comment on this? The competition of CBDCs? Um, at least, um, and I think what, what Max just said, um, I can fully sign that. Uh, for us, for example, as a company, we can do these kind of projects in a way wherever it is possible. And facts will really uh, pave the way for this. So if, if China is faster or another region, which is in that way, um, okay, that it works out for business models, then they pave the way for uh, future solutions. And uh, this is something we should keep in mind. Um, we should also be more um, experimental on that uh, before we discuss too much, uh, we should do the one or the other thing, perhaps already uh, putting things into place that uh, we can handle these things and these projects here in Europe. Um, and um, that's still remaining a learning journey in that sense, but um, it uh, gives us at least the chance to learn here in Europe, uh, because if not, yeah, then it will be done by whomever in other areas, in other regions. Yeah, I think that's clear. Uh, we can, you know, observe that everywhere. I think I, I read yesterday an article about Russia now considering to introduce a CBDC. So they join in the, you know, growing chorus of nations um, going down that route. Um, let's turn to the crypto space again. What do you believe uh, would be the impact of CBDC on cryptocurrencies? That was one question by our um, audience. Who has a view on the impact of CBDC once it's there on the existing cryptocurrencies? I have a personal view, which, which I can share. Um, cryptocurrencies, had been a very interesting and fascinating niche for um, tech oriented and interested people. But so far they did not really made it to mass adoption because it had been too complicated to use. Now we are seeing uh, players like PayPal introducing um, that you can pay with cryptocurrencies. And I think that's a major step forward. However, there is certainly the risk for the like established cryptocurrencies that they will be overtaken by a CBDC once it is in place, because then you know hatching falls away. Everything that Helga stressed, um, you know, of maintaining uh, liquidity versus assets, um, and also the tax implementations, which are quite complicated um, to actually observe. Um, are not arising when using CBDC. So I personally would say if there is a euro as CBDC, there is quite a chance that um, the growth of cryptocurrencies will see, um, yeah, a slowing down, uh, I would say. Um, I have a little bit of different uh, personal opinion. And I uh, think that cryptocurrency or like the CBDC could drive cryptocurrency adoption even further. And I think that um, we have to keep in mind that um, um, we don't know yet how the CBDC will look like if we have like a still some type of fractional reserve there, if we have a fully backed CBDC. And um, 
so I don't think that they are direct competitors. And um, for this reason, I think that CBDC will drive, uh, could drive the adoption for it. And this is my point of view on this. It, it all depends on how regional those CBDCs are. I mean, uh, one of the characteristics of um, the, the paper uh, crypto accepted is, is that they are worldwide. Um, if the China Chinese CBDC is only exchangeable uh, or usable in, in China, it, uh, there's no influence, in fact, uh, except to raise awareness uh, um, and, and, and to educate uh, the whole market, in fact. Uh, so it depends on, on the regulation of each of the CBDC. I mean, basically, if... Uh... Sorry, again. Please go no, ahead. Just go ahead. Just go ahead. <laughs> I, I was just, uh, I was just mentioning a brief comment here. I mean, it also depends largely on uh, what we've been, uh, what the several cryptocurrencies have been uh, basically introduced to. If you read the original protocol from Bitcoin, for example, it was never intended to be a payment platform. And uh, I think also in regards to scalability and like you know, into basically progressive industrial use. You need to like you know comply with uh, certain standards. So as long as it is uh, kind of digital assets and it uh, revolves into like you know basically creating a new asset standard, it definitely has a role. Like uh, Bitcoin can be the new uh, gold because you already see that like uh, major of uh, the major of uh, the young people actually invest in Bitcoin and at least have enough Bitcoin or as much Bitcoin as they have own gold. So from that sense, it is definitely it has its role as a digital asset. But we need to, I think, separate here from payment networks because there is more to it. There is more regulation. And, you know, as you just mentioned, I mean, there is also like, you know, certain kind of tax reductions and certain kind of like, you know, kind of international regulations which we need to comply to. And in order not to make it very complicated, um, we need to like, you know, enable something which is like, you know, the payment backbone. Never mentioning that you can't basically merge that with cryptos at one point, and you know you can basically create a new platform out of it. But I would see cryptos and cryptocurrencies um, more as a kind of digital asset and investment instead of like really creating a multi and a multimodal uh, payment platform out of it. Yeah. Um, thanks, Max. And what I wanted to add because I just read it here in the chat, and I think that is one important aspect. Now we are trying and and for sure, and that is reasonable to, to start really spreading that uh, CBDC issue and getting a digital euro. That's important. That's uh, absolutely important. Um, but uh, Goran here put it, uh, I think, in the chat to say, um, yeah, the, the crypto um, scene, let me put it like that, they were the innovators. Um, and that is for sure something which um, I think we cannot really say, okay, we have to keep it in an experimental space, blah, blah, blah. So innovation does not work like that. But we have to be aware that uh, without this, we would not sit here together today and think about that. And, and this is something I don't know how we can foster uh, innovation and experiments on that. But uh, um, in principle, I think, yeah, cryptos in that sense will not be um, really reasonable for any kind of um, payment, which is finally done in a commercial aspect, which is um, legally okay in that sense. But um, yeah, on the other hand, I'm really thinking, hey, this was uh, absolutely inspiring. Um, that is why we are sitting here. That is still why technologies on that are developed to handle it, to keep data in another manner. And so far, I don't know how this balance could be, um, but um, it is definitely uh, pretty, pretty important. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I do agree to that. And um, uh, one, one comment here in the chat is, was the purpose of cryptocurrency to get away from central banks? And I guess, yes, initially it was, but that's the way it is. If you are so successful uh, in, in proposing such exciting tools, then ultimately you might end up uh, more or less being copied by the player you um, intended to replace. So we will see how that all goes. I thank you so much for sharing your views and, and, and thoughts. We need to come to an end. We are already slightly over the time now. 
Um, thanks for sharing the uh, use cases, which hopefully will build the base for the discussion following now. Um, and having said that, the next session uh, will start soon. And I hand over to Monica. Many thanks. Thank you very much, Nina. Welcome, everybody. We're going to have a lot of fun in this panel. Woo! <laughs> OK, so as you heard already, um, a lot of innovation and a, not, a lot of debates as to the need for a CBDC. Um, and the one thing that um, first to explain, hello, greetings from South Africa. Beautiful Cape Town. I'm, um, I'm bringing a little bit of the emphasis of what is needed in the developing world. Um, I'm originally from Uruguay and I live in South Africa for many years. And I can tell you that financial inclusion is for me a crime against humanity that this world that we created has left out 1.7 billion people out of the financial markets in any shape or form, inability to, to create any sort of wealth. And uh, I could write a book as to why that happened, but this is the time that we can to um, change all this. And that's why I'm finding totally excited uh, to imagine a money in a, new, in a new way. Also the issue of remittances, the issue of cross borders, the, uh, some countries you can, you earn your money in the currency of that country and you cannot move it out of the country today if you want to sell the argentinian peso uh, in in another country nobody's going to touch it so imagine being stuck in argentina and therefore it brings huge challenges, uh, remittances, cross-border, etc. So that's why I'm very uh, honored and touched and uh, excited actually uh, and say thank you to the European Central Bank for allowing me the opportunity to have this conversation with this panel because it's like all the questions I ever wanted to ask, I can ask. <laughs> so welcome um, first to Michael uh, Spitz. Um, as you heard today, that uh, clearly, uh, Michael, I can see that what happened is that your company was created to uh, get away from the antibodies of the big commercial bank and therefore allow you to innovate. Um, um, <laughs> because uh, let's be honest, when you try to innovate from within and you have to disrupt yourself, sometimes it's not that easy, so that's better to you know, create a separate entity that you can wear jeans and t-shirts and you can, you know, have all these creative ideas. So welcome, Michael. I'm really looking forward to hearing um, exactly what is it that you're incubating and, and your ideas and, and this um, 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 production of a stable coin um, um, jointly with Daimler Benz. And then, of course, Christian Catalini from Libra. Oh my God, we've got so many questions for Libra. <laughs> because let's be honest, Libra put the cat amongst the pigeons and that was wonderful. Because you know what, this is, you know, like people used to ask me, I want a faster horse. And I'm saying, guys, this is not about faster horse. This is a new car. And therefore today you cannot even begin to imagine what this new technology is going to do to your life. And that's why when people say, why can we not keep what we got? Because the reality is that all assets will be tokenized. And if all assets get tokenized, as you heard already, you heard about energy, you heard about parking, you heard about tokenizing cars, uh, tracks, giving tracks an identity. I don't you love that? <laughs> so if assets are tokenized, just imagine that for the payments, you require a tokenized money that is programmable. And the current fiat, in any way you look at it, payment mechanism, I don't care how efficient it is, it's still inefficient in coping with the world of tokenization of assets. And that's why um, uh, Ricky from um, uh, Bosch is so um, um, you know, um, motivated by a CBDC or a, a digital programmable body that will help him. With, um, with all these assets that he's going to tokenize. And then we got Jesse Sarnicki, and he used to be at Make It Out, uh, Jesse, uh, now I believe you are with Fountain, and Fountain is a decentralized securities trading, and that's also fascinating. You know, I used to run the Central Securities Depository in South Africa for 20 years. It was, it's, as you know, stock markets are totally centralized, full of intermediaries, full of in inefficiencies in the back office, in the post trade. And the reality is that if you tokenize the shares, you can have real time trading, clearing, settlement, 
And now you need a payment mechanism to match the, the fact that you tokenize the securities. And finally, but not least, Kathleen Braitman, um, a brilliant person that I've been following. She um, is the co-founder uh, of Tezos, and she's going to be telling us about the work Tezos is doing with the uh, uh, Bank de France. And um, so welcome to my beautiful panel. Where are they? I cannot see your pictures. Um, are you all here? Are your videos on? Yes, I can see you. Hello. <laughs> I love seeing people in the pictures. Who's missing? Someone's missing. Wait, Jacek, where are you? Sorry, I'm missing Jacek. Is Jacek here? Oops. I think we, we missed Jacek. He's not here. Hmm. We're going to miss the questions from the, uh, that I have for Make a DAO. Sorry, guys. OK, we'll carry on. So please do me a favor, each and every one of you explain what are you doing and why you're doing it. I always want to know the why, you know, the purpose. Why do you wake up in the morning? What drives you? Why are you putting up with so much criticism, Libra? What is driving you? What is the end goal? What, what, what are you trying to really achieve? So Michael, I want to start with you um, uh, because I think it's a great segue from the fact that we were talking about, you know, a Commerce Bank and then events. Tell us about what you're doing and am I getting this right that you were created independently to protect you from the antibodies of the bank? Or am I exaggerating? <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe maybe I, I don't know about this, but um, thank you for having me. So my name is Michael Spence. I'm the CEO of Mining Kubata, which is the R&D and corporate venture capital arm of Commerce Bank Group. We were originally founded in 2013, but only when I took over in the end of 2016, I brought in the DLT developer team in, from Commerce Bank into a separate unit in order to kind of, on the one hand, be more flexible because you have to understand a regulated entity is regulated for a purpose and you cannot be wheeling and dealing as you like because a bank is dealing with other people's money. So you need to be somewhat concerned about data and so on. And it is, is much easier to develop new stuff um, new interesting stuff uh, if you are in a, in a separate legal entity. And uh, we focus on three main areas. One is what we refer to as community development, where we engage with different communities, including like here, or with the ECB, with the Bundesbank, and so on. We, we organize meetups and, and, and trying to engage with the community. And it's great because this is where we get a lot of creativity. A lot of the people who have great ideas who come up with should we have a stable coin? Should we have this? And I'm then seen as the banker, as a more conservative guy, but no, I'm somewhat in between. Um, then we have, of course, the venture side. We looked at more than 4,000 startups. We invested uh, with the two arms, main incubator and commerce ventures in 45, which puts us straight after City and Goldman, number three in the world, number one in Europe. So we've seen our fair share. Uh, we're running uh, investments both in R3. We were, uh, also sit on the board there and on on, on finality, which used to be called USC. So, so we do have a little bit on HQLX, eToro. So we have some exposure to these, uh, to these entities and seeing how they works from a, a participation equity point of view. And then last but not least, we, we look at technology readiness level, te future technology, we believe, other than a planet centricity, which is very important. And that, that's why I liked the question and I was very happy to answer in what's the impact on program of recurrency on the sustainable development goals, how can it be about inclusion and so on? I think there are three mega trends about you know, physical, digital, and biological. We combine these in order to get into certain things. And one of them uh, is a blockchain or DLT, and we experimented quite a lot, but ultimately we want to make sure how can we help our clients, the clients of the bank, so you know, we connected blockchain smart contracts to Target 2. We connected them also to on the e-money as, as it was explained by Helge and by Bosch. Uh, and you know, wearing very extensively also at the moment in an, another group is a Bank de France uh, experiment work on, on a couple of work streams as the ECB. How could that actually happen and why do we really need it? So I, I'm, I was very, very happy when the ECB announced what they're trying to do, which way they're going in instant payment. And I said, but for 70, 80% of the use cases that I was dreaming about program of a currency, we have a solution already up in there that is already at our fingertips. So we use other stuff. And then it comes into question of, uh, you know, and I'm not gonna kind of cover the whole sector now, but you know, how can we get it legally binding? How do we, do we want to have interest being part of the currency or not? You know, a lot of interesting question. And is, are we talking actually about the money? Are we talking just about the payment rails? And this is totally different because you can transfer euro, maybe more efficient programmable without actually needing a CBDC. Uh, or you may want to have it as a monetary policy 
whether it's 100% backed or not monetary, but, like, but that changes the way and I think the perspective. And I grew up in Caracas, Venezuela, so I know, you know, you have different central banks. Uh, I'm very glad at the moment uh, living in Germany that I have the ECB. So I think it also changes the perspective on what you're trying to engage with. So that's me. Thank you, Michael. Absolutely. Yes. So you know what I mean about countries where you stuck with some challenges in terms of your central bank. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, I would um, now would like to introduce Christian Catalini from Libra. Oh, there's Jessek. Woo! Thank you. We lost you there for a while. Jessek, welcome. <laughs> okay, Christian, go for it. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, so, you know, when you asked what are the things that um, you know, not only keep me awake at night, but also uh, the reasons why uh, I think me, as many other people on this project, are pushing for um, kind of a new solution in this space, uh, I think there's at least three dimensions. Uh, inclusion, and, and I'll give you a little bit of an overview on how we're thinking about financial inclusion um, and expanding access to unbanked and underbanked. Integrity. Uh, and, and, and innovation and competition. So th those are really the core three. Um, and you know, starting from, from the inclusion one, uh, even if you take just cross-border and remittances, around one in nine people globally are supported uh, by funds uh, that they receive from their family members somewhere abroad. And the cost for these transfers are extremely high. So the World Bank data for Q3 2020 is that on average, you're paying 6.75% to send money. Uh, now people sometimes say, well, but there's the digital solution. Sure, even the digitally native senders spend on average 4.2%. Uh, and, and often, you know, we ascribe those costs to ML, CFT, compliance, but that's simply not true. If you look at, you know, market structure where there's less competition, those fees and markups are way higher. Not only, you know, there's high cost, but fees take days uh, and that's additional delays. <clears throat> We've also seen kind of another side of, uh, the lack of financial inclusion and, and through these draw rails when it comes to payments uh, with COVID. Uh, you know, a number of countries, uh, about 60, uh, have increased their uh, traditional cash transfer programs in trying to deploy stimulus checks and the like. And even in the US, you had to wait for more than 20 weeks to receive these uh, through mail, uh, through, you know, traditional bank check. Uh, this, this kind of slowness in, in transferring value is, is really hurting society and, and a number of use cases. So I, I think there's a long road on, on financial inclusion. Now, the good news is that out of 1.7 billion people that are currently unbanked, uh, the vast majority, over a billion, has a mobile phone and many have access to data. So there is an endpoint that can be used uh, to bring these people literally online and provide them cheap, interoperable, low-cost services. <clears throat> the second item is integrity. Uh, we often talk about how the current system you know, is best in class at AML, CFT, sanctions, uh, but the reality is actually that uh, we could do way, way better. Uh, in fact, we catch single digit numbers of criminal activity, in many of these networks. Um, and, and so, you know, from fragmentation in KYC systems to the fact that they're not really interoperable, data is not really shared. Uh, the SARS that are filed are not that useful even for the financial intelligence units that are trying to use them. Uh, I think there's massive room for improvement here in providing public private infrastructure on, on how we're thinking about identity uh, of course, in a way that preserves privacy and allows for different degrees of selective disclosure and replicate some of the protections that we come to enjoy uh, through cash and, and, and other uh, parts of the current system. <clears throat> the last point that I was mentioning is innovation. Uh, and this one strictly relates also to competition. I think one thing that is often misunderstood about Libra is that Libra is designed like an open technology standard of the internet, TCP IP, SMTP, these standards are meant to be interoperable, open, and, and to really encourage fierce competition on top of them. They're literally designed to be shared infrastructure, so kind of like a public utility, and to allow firms and you know, both public and private sector participants to build on top on a leveling playing field. Uh, now, the challenge is, of course, you know, uh, a CBDC rail would be extremely useful to society, uh, but these changes in many of these countries are happening uh, too slowly. Um, and, and so there, there's an opportunity here to upgrade payment systems, bring competition, uh, just think about card networks and other uh, realms there where both consumers and businesses are paying a heavy tax uh, for moving essentially what are safe, secure, and compliant digital messages. Uh, so our hope is that by encouraging a network that really brings some of the good market design of interoperable systems, 
by enabling through interoperability in payments in a number of financial services, we will bring a wave of innovation that will eventually lead to, to broader financial inclusion. But I look forward to discussing all of this uh, with you today on this panel. Wonderful, thank you so much, that's excellent. And Kathleen, go for it, tell us about you. Thank you. Yeah, and, and, and Christian's a hard act to follow. Um, but, uh, but yeah, thanks for the preamble. I think we're all kind of motivated by similar things, which is, you know, more broadly, basically finance is the technology, you know, broadly speaking, used to exchange contractually defined cash flows. Um, but I think of it also as like a technology for, for thriving, you know, similar to property rights, education, all that good stuff. Um, and, you know, historically, this has been more accessible to, um, you know, wealthier people. Um, but I think with, you know, programmable money, all of these um, different sorts of uh, cryptocurrency based, um, hopefully, uh, you know, coordination technologies, um, things like access to financial services can hopefully have a lower ticket price and, and reach more people, right? Um, because everyone deserves to have like a, a tool for, for thriving. Um, and so, uh, you know, I come from this from like uh, the cryptocurrency space. I, I co-founded a smart contract platform called Tezos, um, which is in many ways akin to Ethereum and Bitcoin. Um, but for one you know, special feature, which is that uh, Tezos has a formal mechanism to upgrade itself. Um, we think that that has a strategic advantage in the long run. Um, and in the short run, you know, it also has, I think, been first to market with some things like a large scale proof of stake, um, which is you know, arguably a bit more, um, more eco-friendly um, than its proof of work counterpart. Um, so yeah, I've been working on Tezos for the last few years. Um, it's been a bomb to my heart to see some of the um, interest from larger financial actors in sort of putting public blockchains, um, you know, uh, more traditionally known as cryptocurrencies, um, at the forefront for this type of financial innovation. Um, I've worked at places like Accenture and R3, which are also pretty big actors in this space, and I, I do see a comparative advantage for using, um, you know, public open source standards as opposed to um, things run by a private enterprise. Um, so I'm happy to speak to that today, and I'm also happy to talk about cryptocurrencies, but, uh, but yeah, no, this is the tough acts to follow. So I'm really excited to be here. Excellent. Thank you, Kathleen. That's wonderful. And uh, Jessica, I don't know if you heard my presentation. I don't know where you were, but I couldn't find you. So welcome. Uh, so what I was saying is that I looked and I saw that you used to work to, for MakerDAO, but you work now for Fountain. And I was telling everybody what Fountain does, which is this decentralized security trading and how important it is um, to that what you bring into the world. And I would love you to talk about how important uh, not only MakerDAO, but also about your the concept of uh, tokenized securities and why the, the, the importance of having a tokenized payment mechanism to enable this real-time settlement that you need if, to be very effective. So just tell us about you, why are you doing this, and, um, and exactly what you're doing. Thank you, Monica. I was able to, uh, to hear everyone um, and listen to your presentation. I would just use another link, which made me appear under another name. That's why <laughs> you, couldn't, you couldn't find me, but I was able to, to, to hear everything. Uh, so yeah, I've been, you know, since the very beginning of my career, I've been at the intersect of law, finance, and technology, and you know, this is why blockchain, programmable money, and stable coins are at the core of my interest. Um, and uh, uh, I am a global legal counsel at the Maker Foundation. This is my current affiliation. Fountain is a very new project. It only has a few days. Uh, it's it's a completely uh, <laughs> side side project. I am representing Maker Foundation now. And um, yeah, uh, you know, it's uh, it's it's always um, very interesting to be on this type of panels because we, as maker, we are uh, um, presenting a completely different approach to how to build uh, money, uh, how to contribute to uh, the uh, evolution of money, um, and I'm sure that uh, we will have more time to uh, elaborate on this. Uh, just as a as a short introduction. Uh, Maker Foundation is one of the entities um, uh, within the community working on the Maker Protocol, uh, which is uh, yeah, uh, a decentralized stablecoin protocol. Uh, and the decentralized stablecoin uh, that is generated within this protocol is called DAI, with, as I said, a completely different approach to how money should look like, because it's uh, open, permissionless, uh, completely decentralized, without a centralized issuer, uh, without a centralized operator of the entire system. And yeah, they uh, has been in operation for um, the first version of the system for two years now. The final version called multi-collateral DAI uh, 
uh, it's almost a year uh, once it is with us uh, and there is almost 1 billion of die in operation, making it a very successful project. Um, even though, uh, you know, we, we are you know, pursuing this completely different uh, open permissionless uh, transparent path as opposed to many other stable coins or yeah, pr programmable money examples out there. Uh, happy to tell more uh, later in the, in the meeting. Thank you so much. I was looking at some information and it says that MakerDAO is uh, being used very heavily in Argentina and Venezuela. Is that correct? Yeah, from, from what I know, uh, uh, yes, uh, DAI has been a huge success, especially in those places in which there is a huge demand for real bull uh, and independent money. Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, this type of uh, this type of assets that uh, really give people freedom and financial inclusion if they cannot find them elsewhere. Exactly. So yeah, that's and, that's yeah. exactly the case. Yeah. So if so, the whole idea is to reimagine money. And if money has got three components in terms of the definition, it's a store of value, a unit of account, a medium of exchange. Would you say that the DAI meets that definition? I think so. I I think that um, I mean. Um, when you look at, you know, DAI is really pursuing this uh, permissionless uh, and open path of really, uh, uh, you know, uh, started by Bitcoin, right? Mm -hmm. But Bitcoin was missing this key feature of being stable, which is one, it, which is why it's not functioning as money, right? This is this is like a probably like now people are saying uh, about it as a separate asset class, right? Digital mm -hmm. gold, perhaps. And I do to like additional technology layer and also governance layer, that decentralized governance layer put on top of it, uh, you know, solves this problem of stability um, to, to the extent possible, making a, a, a cryptocurrency, a, a digital asset, which is as decentralized as Bitcoin itself, right? Or many other cryptocurrencies, yet it also provides this additional value of stability. So yeah, I think that it checks all boxes. On the boxes, thank you. And Christian, is Libra going to be decentralized or is it centralized? I don't have it clear. Yeah, so that, that's a really important uh, mm. question. In, in the first white paper, you, you, you may remember, we discussed a mm. future transition to a permissionless system. Yeah. And uh, from an economics perspective, permissionless systems have some really interesting and, and, and important properties. Um, after conversations with regulators, it became clear though, that it would be very difficult, if not impossible, to build a safe, compliant payment system, uh, which is kind of the, the goal of Libra, um, in, in a permissionless framework. Um, especially when it comes to you know, the safety and integrity of the network, uh, we have a number of provisions that are targeted at ensuring that transactions are compliant with things like the travel rule uh, and, and other um, ML CFT concerns. And if the network were to transition to fully permissionless, you would have no way to guarantee that all those protections are kept in place. Mm -hmm. uh, that said, uh, you know, of course, permission networks have a number of drawbacks, uh, mm -hmm. namely from an economics perspective, the fact that you have a small number of actors uh, running validator nodes, yeah. playing governance, and, and kind yeah. of a, the designing the evolution of the system uh, that have control over the network. Uh, so Libra will be a hybrid, um, although it's starting with a permission uh, perimeter. Uh, we're planning to reintroduce essentially market forces through auction design. This is something that is well understood in economics. In fact, governments have used the technique, for example, for, us, for assigning spectrum, um, which, which is a public resource. Um, so the basic intuition is that beyond a, a, an initial check, where if you want to be a validator or eventually participate in governance, you, you have to be a compliant actor and essentially apply all the compliance provisions and, and, and kind of the ML CFT framework of the network, you should be able to compete for resources on, a, on an equal footing. Uh, so that, that's essentially the basic intuition where you're starting with a number of members and a number of validators run by those members. But over time, you're introducing market forces and kind of opening up uh, both the provision of services and competition for governance uh, into, into the ecosystem. So that, that's kind of the, the design that we're pursuing. We, we think it kind of blends together some of the best features of permissionless networks within the regulated framework of a payment system. Uh, so uh, as you may know, uh, Libra is currently applying uh, through FINMA uh, for a payment system uh, license application, which is you know, very close to kind of a full banking application in, in Switzerland. That's great. So I've got a question. Um, you're talking about, like you kept on changing your mind, I think, about how you're gonna collateralize 
this um, a coin. So where are we on what you're going to do? Are you going to use the dollar, the euro, or a basket? What are you going to do? Yeah, so the project in, in, in the iteration on the second white paper uh, moved away from having only uh, a multi-currency basket as its uh, only asset. Uh, remember, the design of Libra is really targeted at cross-border use case. This is where the costs are extremely high. This is where there's a lot of free, uh, you know, friction and, and latency. Uh, and so we were starting with a currency that was meant to really support cross-border. Uh, now, with the redesign, the goal is really to work through a series of single currency stable coins, starting with something like a Libra dollar, Libra pound, and so on, and develop the system further, uh, including a composite, uh, which, uh, you know, has some similarities with the, with the multi-currency originally taught, but also some substantial differences. The backing will be one for one. Uh, so for every, you know, Libra dollar, there will be an equivalent uh, amount of treasuries, uh, 90 days or less. So these are technically defined under Basel III as HQLAs, high, high quality liquid assets. Uh, and the reserve will actually be over collateralized. Uh, on that, we, we just took a page from, from, from again, uh, the banking and financial sector regulation. The Basel III framework establishes kind of a methodology for thinking through uh, what is the exposure that the reserve would have at different moments in time uh, in terms of credit risk, which is very limited because the, the exposure is to sovereigns, uh, market risk, think about interest rate shocks, uh, liquidity risk, and, and of course, operational risk. So uh, de facto, the reserve will be over collateralized. And it is really very much the first stable coin to go through that thinking of what does a system uh, that really promotes financial stability and, and you know, ensures a high degree of reliability needs to look like uh, so that it can be used safely uh, for payments. So, for example, when the uh, euro gets created in a central bank digital, digital currency, that means that the um, a holder of this um, the digital currency will have a claim against the central bank. So are we saying that if I hold a Libra or whatever you want to call it, I can have a claim against Facebook's balance sheet or whose balance sheet can I go and call when I have a concern? Yeah, so, um, you know, first of all, uh, Facebook is only one of the over uh, 27 members that are, uh, you know, behind the association and has one vote uh, among all of them. Um, but to clarify, uh, I think your question is really interesting because the design of Libra, which is kind of unique relative to other stablecoin projects, is one where we want the network to be upgradable towards CBDCs. So we envision a future where there are CBDCs. And Libra stops operating a reserve. The only reason why we have to design a reserve in this phase is because there is no such thing as a public programmable digital layer. Uh, we're, we're not in the business of, of settlement or you know, value creation and, and, and kind of value protection. Uh, we're really in the business of developing an efficient payment layer and payment application and financial applications on top mm -hmm. of that. So in a, in a world where you do have a digital euro, the reserve would stop operating the reserve and directly integrate with the public sector. Um, now, depending on what the public sector solution is in different parts of the world, what that integration actually looks like may differ. We, we've seen all sort of proposals around wholesale CBDCs, synthetic CBDCs, and so we want the network to be able to integrate with all these different models. Um, in, in, at the starting point, uh, to answer your second part of the question, if you're holding um, you know, a, a Libra dollar coin, for example, uh, there'll be a structure of rights that will really, really will protect consumers and ensure that all the participants of the network can really come in and out, uh, even in extreme market conditions. Uh, and this goes back to, again, applying things like the Basel framework to the design of the reserve and, and ensuring that there are strong legal protections at every step of the chain. Mm -hmm. Um, um, not to be um, very controversial, but it can be controversial, <laughs> is that, you know, the comment that you have to be in a private permission environment, the, there are questions being posed to you that uh, challenge that concept. And um, Jessica, I would love you to answer that because I'm sure you're dying to say something about this because you went for the, 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 the concept, which is really the concept that was written in the white paper of Satoshi Nakamoto's creating Bitcoin, which is the concept of using the, you know, the permissionless mainlet. You know, I work for the biggest blockchain company in the world, Consensus, and we truly believe that ultimately the world will move there because 
when the internet was created, yes, we all built little intranets because we couldn't trust each other. But eventually we, we went free no? in the internet. So um, just, uh, just talk to me about this. And then I want to hear from Michael, from your board uh, perspective on finality and, and how do you feel about this uh, concept? Uh, do you have to go private? Do you have to, does it have to be a public or, or you know, because just remember Christian that we all very worried about um, what will happen with the data of um, the usage of the Libra, that is the elephant in the room and we need to talk about it. And, you know, that is a big concern, but I want Jessica to talk about, um, because he went for the most purest uh, in MakerDAO, the most purest form, uh, which that's why I think that it's so liberating to be able to use the DAO in so many ways. And in so many ways, you can talk about uh, so many other functionalities that you have uh, in, in MakerDAO that makes it so um, user friendly. Yes, you need to understand how to use it. It's still a little bit techy, you know, it's not for my grandmother. Do you know what I'm saying, Jessica? It's real, uh, still the user experience requires a little bit of a technical evolution, which I think Libra will actually be simpler to use, but we need to put on the table, what is it that we are getting into? And that's why at the end of the day, I really believe that a CBDC backed by a central bank um, it will give me more comfort if I have to advise my grandmother, for example. Uh, but just like you tell me about this concept of the permissionless versus the using a private, you know, um, situation. Sure. Let me let me just first fully agree with uh, what Christian said about the importance of uh, you know correct uh, and conservative regulatory approach and complying with the law. Uh, I think that's uh, especially important in light of the recent you know regulatory developments like the uh, Mika Mika regulation proposal uh, in the EU. Uh, I think that it, this is like a call for any players, all the players in the space, uh, to mm -hmm. yeah, to to pay double attention to uh, to regulations. Uh, this this is just a proposal, and it can, could be improved in many ways. But I think it is a step in the right direction. Uh, and you know, even if uh, even though we, as as the Maker Foundation, uh, uh, contributing to the Maker Protocol, you know, we are contributing to a, a, a very permissionless and decentralized project. Uh, we you know we are sometimes called called the most legally conservative project, and I think that this is to a large extent true. Um, but moving to your question, uh, it's I think that you know the discussion between permissionless and permissioned is very very often. Uh, very much ideological, and this is the this is the perspective that I'd like to avoid here, at least personally. I think that there is there this is a fundamental choice be, uh, behind certain values or value propositions uh, behind permissionless networks and permission solutions, uh, and I think that we as I, I'm talking from my personal perspective now, but I think that this is shared uh, by by many people in the maker community. What really uh, you know changes the game is uh, open permissionless protocols and universal settlement layers they bring. So it really does make sense to build on top of those protocols, right? Because they are really, you know, they are not providing an incremental improvement over, uh, you know, to, to provide something that is a little bit faster or a little bit, uh, you know, most more co cost efficient. This is a completely different game of creating, you know, a, um, common protocols for transferring value. And it's just it just makes sense to build on top of them. And then if you're building on top of them, you need to somehow uh, you know share some or like you know do some design choices, right? And very often it just makes sense to follow those principles of the infrastructure that you that you're using, right? So if you're building on an uh, open permissionless infrastructure like Ethereum or like Tezos. Uh, it kind of make, makes a lot of sense to follow many um, of the principles or the values that stem from this infrastructure. And this is, I think, the, the, so, the, you know, the, the, the key reason why DAI is, is also decentralized and permissionless. It is because it can, because it operates on a such infrastructure, which wouldn't be possible for other infrastructures and other assets, including those infrastructures that are you know, solely built to serve uh, a specific purpose rather than uh, you know, be, have a, this ambition of, of becoming a, you know, unbiased objective layer for anyone to use. Agree. Um, and Michael, talk to me. Do you mind talking about finality and what they're doing? That that could also be fascinating to understand. 
I'm, I'm, uh, well, I'm only talking uh, in, in my own capacity, in my own yeah. my own views. But uh, yeah. you know, given the fact we're an investor, I can give you some clues of where we're at. First of all, I mean, to everyone, whether it's Christian, Kathleen, uh, Jacek, uh, and even Monica, uh, you have all steered in a way where, where the established players have all of a sudden said, "Okay, what is there out there? What can we do? Why do we need to be?" Uh, changing the way that we think about payments as such with the advent of a new technology. And that includes not just one technology as DLT or, or blockchain, but you know the whole advent of IoT and how we're moving into a new society and, and many other stuff. Uh, predominantly, you know, being representing uh, a, a European bank, uh, our, our core interest is, of course, the euro, because that is what we're dealing with at the moment. And the question is, despite the fact what is technically possible, we still need to put it in a more regulated environment because as a bank, as I stated, we are dealing with other people's money and I cannot get, oops, you know, we tried it, you know, we didn't work, sorry guys. You know, it's a different thing. You know, it doesn't work very well with our board and with the clients, of course. So I think we really try to say what is technically possible, but our focus was not so much, how can we talk about remittance? How can we talk about non-G7 countries because Probably if, if I would have designed something around that, I would have gone to the, to the World Bank and said, why don't we get special drawing rights and tokenize that? That would be my solution to, to the problem and then not create a, something private. But you know, again, I'm not, I was not have to make these design changes, choices. For me, it was really the question, how can I help the clients? How can I help the likes of Helge? How can I, uh, on, on Daimler and Volkswagen, BMW, and these German corporates, and, but also the, the retail, how can we actually do this? And, how is it currently not possible? And, you know, of course, when Christian explained how long things take, I'm totally with you. And it's, I think it's very important that we continue to advance, you know, but there are different possibilities, you know, some of them can be by a, uh, by a new method. Some of them can be by improving. I mean, with the, with the choices that the ECB have taken recently or the recommendations to move from an instant payment into maybe even getting to connecting to tips, it's fantastic. So if you have, if you're just a European and want to deal in Euro, I, I think TIPS has a great, uh, you know, what uh, for 99%, 5% is a good time. You can get everything instant and it's very cost efficient. So you do not need a DLT technology. Nevertheless, there come other questions. How do you deal with the question of finality, not in the sense of the company, but, but ultimately not having someone else to press a button, but being able to program it from one machine to the other. And although ultimately we believe that there should be uh, the, there should be a case next to cash and to normal digital currency. There should also be the CBDC. And I, I think it's a great, I, and I really applaud the Bank de France, but also Bundesbank on really evaluating how to run a node. What does it mean? But what are the consequences for monetary policy? I mean, and I'm sure that Ulrich's going to talk a little bit later in the next panel about this. But I think, you know, having the possibility to initially back uh, whatever you call it, token or you call it money. But I think the reliance on a stability is much more important because what's going to happen if you all of a sudden have a, a, a programmable euro that has a different value than the fiat euro? And it may be because it does not include interest. So it may be maybe yielding higher or lower. So you want to make sure that, that, the, that the mass consumer is actually, you know, content and happy with the stability uh, that he's dealing with. And from that point of view, you know, ease of use is very important, but I think, you know, that's why I'm coming back to the question of, is it a payment system and are we trying to move Euro around? Are we trying to create a new currency? And you could see from the discussion also Christian had saying, okay, we want to have a, a mark currency backing now, of course, with discussion into a, into a more stable country. I think it has its application. And from that point of view, I think it goes into how can we make all the criticism that Christian rightly put it to the current system, can we make it more efficient? And can we do it by being financial institution backing it, working within the G7 on the wholesale angle? I think these are all very limited factors where you come to a point of view, okay, let's start with a permission system. Let's not go with totally open permissionless. And you, I have to explain to you, well, everyone is allowed to be in the system because at the end of the day, and you see that with the latest DORA regulation, even with the ICT community, who are going to be punished? It's going to be the entities that are regulated. And that's why I think we're going to, going to have a very, very good discussion over the next years to come. What kind, of, uh, what kind of technical requirements do you need in order to facilitate the transfer of value or the storage of value? 
Thank you so much, Michael. And, and Kathleen, just talk to us about what the work, the, the work you guys are doing with the Bank de France. Oh, um, well, I, I guess Consensus is also working with uh, Forge, which is, which is a project from Societe Generale, which is obviously a French bank that's been, um, you know, trying to do something with the uh, digital, you know, digital sort of settlement layer. Unfortunately, you know, it's it's not it's not super public yet, right? So, um, you know, more or less what I could say is that it's very likely that, you know, there will be some sort of use case from the Banque de France that'll have a delivery versus payment of a tokenized financial asset against a digital euro issued by the Banque de France. Like, it's very, it's, 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 it doesn't sound like much, but it's actually like a pretty, pretty big step forward um, because they're using obviously a public, uh, public uh, cryptocurrency um, to, to pay that debt. And it's not just Tezos, it's also obviously they're experimenting with Ethereum and a number of other, um, another number of other public chains. Um, I will say though, um, just just hearing the other panelists, um, uh, I do think that it's probably worth for the sake of the audience, um, sort of defining uh, what we talk about when we talk about stable coins. Um, because like traditionally a stable coin is like a cryptocurrency that's like stabilized uh, through algorithmic financial engineering. Um, you know, typically it's a synthetic peg uh, to the value of some fiat currency, which is, you know, all fair and good. That's obviously what MakerDAO has been doing for quite some time and with some tremendous success. Um, and then more recently, the term has been used to describe like essentially a tokenized bank account. So this is like USDC, Paxos, Tether, um, and that's fundamentally different, right? Um, and then you have like a CBDC. So like calling a Euro like CBDC a stable coin is a little bit confusing because it could refer to um, all three of these categories. And I would posit that a CBDC is a tokenized account at the central bank itself or a tokenized representation of accounts managed by banks, but under the explicit like aegis and blessing of a central bank, which is obviously a, a massive huge step forward from like, you know, traditional synthetic engineering. Um, which is why, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it is a huge step forward and, and candidly, um, you know, in my, in my sort of travels around the world of blockchains, um, I think the Banque de France uh, initiative is, is perfect, particularly, um, particularly groundbreaking because um, historically I would go to like smaller nations that have sort of a mandate, right, for um, some sort of CBDC or some, like, you know, some sort of uh, issuance from their central bank. And it would sort of be without teeth, like it would be, you know, a blockchain without the interesting parts, right, which is, which is, you know, fundamentally uh, something that goes to the censorship resistant sort of infrastructure of a traditional cryptocurrency and leverages that and maybe uses smart contracts, right, to, um, uh, to create programmable money. And I think that's more interesting um, than just sort of uh, sort of a, a, a sort of private fork of a more traditional cryptocurrency like Ethereum or Tezos and, and not really leveraging the full force of the validation of a global, um, a global open source you know, network. Um, but, uh, but yeah, no, the, most of the details of the Banque de France initiative, um, to the best of my knowledge, are confidential. Um, but it's, it's, it doesn't sound uh, that groundbreaking, but it's clearly like the inroad towards something um, potentially hugely transformative because of these distinctions that I, I just mentioned. Wow. But the, the project with the Banque de France is more a wholesale CBDC. Is that correct? That's that's my understanding. Yes, yeah. I mean, so yeah. like I uh, I I I um you know I don't work with Nomadic Labs, which is like the French-based uh, initiative. But yes, that is that is the very vanilla like moniker. Yeah, and just to clarify for everybody the difference between wholesale and retail. Do you want to explain that, Kathleen? You're very brilliant to explain it. I disagree. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, I mean, basically we're talking about like interbank things, right? Like we're not talking about something that touches the end user or that you, you know, swipe your credit card with or whatever. Um, so it's it's quite it's quite different than like the idea of um, using Tether or whatever, like the uh, tokenized bank account that I, I mentioned as a distinction. Yeah, so in plain English, wholesale is, with, is really to replace the interbank settlement, but the retail is when you really get to the man in the street replacing cash in a way. And that's why Libra will play a massive role uh, in this re new reality that is being invented and created in the new money order. But I've got a question, just, uh, just explain to me, how do you cope with the KYC AML requirements? Yeah, I think that's a, that, that's a broader question related to how do you do this? How do you comply with this type of regulations in the mm -hmm. context of permissionless networks? 
and mm -hmm. I'm, I'm gonna talk about my perspective personal perspective on the problem because it's it clearly you know this is clearly a challenge uh for for blockchain technology in general and for any transfers of value on uh public ledgers yeah. uh so uh you know you have this you know those uh, vast seas of open and permissionless protocols right that you know in order for their value pro proposition to be really delivered and fulfilled you kind of have to you know live them as you know as open and permissionless as they are right i mean this is this is just the value proposition if you limit this you are limiting the the, the, the you know that the, the very value behind them but that doesn't mean that you cannot for, you know build uh, the regulation in uh, on top of those ledgers and this is something that um some people have been calling walled gardens so a kind of you know uh, islands of those uh, sea, uh, seas of permissionlessness uh, where you know you kind of uh, uh, th those and th which would uh, also act as gateways for especially for retail um, to to use those permissionless protocols and those gateways would be usually more or less centralized and could be used for uh, compliance including AML and KYC requirements. Uh, so this is the type of I, I know that it's very general. I don't I don't think we have more time to elaborate on this, but this is the perspective that I'm um, that I'm having now, and we kind of see this in ordinary cryptocurrency, right? Where like you have the you know, the permissionless Bitcoin, yet you already see that with the entire professionalization that is taking place in the cryptocurrency space. And I think that this is primarily visible here in Europe with, uh, for example, custody being regulated now in Germany and a few other places, that you have all of those like added value services built in. You have those, you know, gold gardens built on top of this uh, permissionless protocol in which the actual compliance with the law takes place. And as a last as a last point, I, that does not mean that the regulation should not change, right? Because very often you have some um, regulatory requirements, you have some uh, provisions of the law that require you to do some things that are not necessarily technology neutral. I mean, everyone thought that they are before we actually found ourselves in the middle of, of the development of the blockchain technology. So that's clearly something that can be improved and is being improved right now with the recent um, uh, EU proposals that I've mentioned that could be even further improved uh, in this direction. Uh, but once this, is, uh, once this is the case, I personally, I'm not a pessimist in terms of compliance with this type of requirements, uh, even by completely permissionless and open networks and products that are utilizing them. Cool. Thank you. Christian, I've got a question for you. So do you believe in self-sovereign identity and how is the whole Libra scenario going to cope with KYC AML? Thank you. I, identity, you know, in, in all these different flavors is extremely important to us. Um, essentially, you know, when you think about privacy, when you think about financial inclusion, the only way to compliant and, and robust, safe and secure financial inclusion will be through better identity standards. These identity standards, very much like the payment network, need to be interoperable so that both small players, large players can all use kind of the same type of infrastructure. They need to be privacy preserving in the right way. Uh, so that, of course, you know, uh, an enforcement agency or someone with a court order uh, would be able to access the relevant information. But otherwise, this is protected both from commercial players and, and kind of the broader participants on the network. Um, and, and so more broadly, while identity is not kind of one of the immediate priorities um, for, for the network, the first step is really enabling uh, fast, cheap and efficient payments. Um, it, it's going to be a really important building block for expanding access. Uh, there's a number of regions of the globe where, <clears throat> again, when you look at the cost, for example, remittances, the claim is often, well, those remittances should be expensive because there's very high AML, CFT and compliance costs. The reality is more that there's a lack of competition. And so, you know, one thing that I would love to demystify is that, first of all, Libra is not designed to compete with uh, fiat. Uh, in fact, you know, any, any economist looking at the design of the reserve would know that this is a complement and an extension of, of what central banks do is not is not meant to compete with them. Um, and, and, and so more broadly, I think what is lacking today in payments and in financial services is competition. The internet has brought innovation to a variety of sectors of society, uh, but also because of the burden of regulation, uh, some of those benefits have not touched financial services. And so I would caution against saying 
the current system is, is currently serving people well uh, because there's large segments even in developed nations that are excluded, are paying too high of a fee, or even if you take small businesses and merchants are paying a heavy tax from interchange costs to all sort of hidden fees when they're trying to accept payments. Um, that said, this is a network that should allow established financial institutions to compete on, on new terms and with better infrastructure. Uh, so we don't see this as, as, as kind of a threat to, to the current system, more kind of as a wake up call that given that we do have digital technology that can enable a lot of these services at a much cheaper level, we should share those benefits um, with, with society. Uh, you know, if I try to send money uh, through my bank to Europe, uh, I'm gonna be charged, you know, 30 to $40. And, and, and of course, you know, the digitally savvy people will use services that lower that cost substantially, but that, that is still the reality. And for a merchant to accept payments, even in Europe, where there's been tremendous progress, I, I think in terms of lowering costs, when you look at intra-regional transfers, the costs are still fairly high. And, you know, the card networks do impose a heavy burden on, on how these services are delivered to small and medium businesses. Thank you. Uh, Ka uh, Kathleen, can I ask you a question? So I'm dying to ask you this question. There's always this debate about account-based, token-based, um, programmable, programmable money. And those are new terms that are coming through in our new way of reimagining money. Please tell us why. Um, Okay, why would we recommend that we should be programmable token based? Why? Yeah, um, that's a, I mean, I have my own opinion and obviously I, I'm talking my own book here, right? Like I co-founded a smart contract platform and the reason I, I get super excited and wake up in the morning is because I think that I can change the world, right? And, uh, and so, you know, basically smart contracts are key to creating programmable money, um, you know, which I would define as like ways to exchange value rapidly using in rules embedded in software, right? Um, that doesn't sound like much, but basically like the world was transformed when, when credit cards were popularized since they expedited the velocity of money. Um, smart contracts can take that step steps further by like triggering more complex payments. Um, and like basically the faster the velocity of money, the less you need in circulation. I think that's like a really transformative way to think about, um, you know, using using value and, and transmitting it without all the, you know, actors that add all the, um, you know, various, various encumbrances uh, that have been, uh, I guess, spoken about before. Um, so yeah, that's what gets me excited. I mean, obviously, um, you know, in the realm of cryptocurrencies, it's sort of, uh, it's sort of legitimacy by fiat, ah, ha, ha. But, uh, but basically, you know, the reason you accept Bitcoin is because you assume other people are going to accept Bitcoin and it has, um, it has to like sort of bootstrap legitimacy. Um, what's fun and interesting about the prospect of a central big digital currency and, and, and sort of having this digitization uh, more rapidly is, is that you could have the same principles um, you know, hopefully using smart contracts and you can, you can apply that to, um, you know, more complex transactions without some of the uh, added, added uh, od odious steps of, of time and, and waste. I agree. Okay, so we're now running out of time. I knew this would happen. I have so many other questions. So I'm going to give every one of you a magic wand, okay? And with this magic wand, you're going to become the ECB, okay? And you're going to tell the ECB that is watching you, what would you do if you had to build the central bank digital currency based on the euro, the, 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 C, you know, the CBDC for the euro? So Michael, you now got the magic one. What would you, what would you do if you had all this power? Um, I, think, I think two things. I, on the one hand, and you picked on that, Monica, before, I would really support, which is not in the remit of the ECB, the SSI, basically empowering, and maybe that's a very European way, empowering the people in Europe who ultimately have the ownership of their own data in their way. It's a different approach to where the US and maybe Asia thinks about things. And I believe that by running a note uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a network for CBC, adding, the, adding an additional feature next to cash, next to, pro, uh, next to normal fiat currency, having that in a program format, uh, I, I would do that because I believe the ECB has the power at the moment by collecting all these different 27 member states, by putting something forward like a CBDC uh, to combine this in order to empower it for the greater good of Europe and ultimately showing this uh, uh, data serenity uh, is a way forward that ultimately can help Europe to, to defend or ultimately to mark into the, the, the next de decades to come, uh, looking in particular into the the SDG, and I'm not trying just to uh, bullshit through. Through, I really mean that we can ultimately 
you know, have the possibility by running that running a, a node on that issuing CBC in addition to what it is. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Christian, you've got the magic wand. What would you tell the ECB? <laughs> Well, first of all, I, I think a lot of the effort that, that is being spurred in Europe is, is, is really important, right? So I think my first comment would try to accelerate as much as you can the pace of these types of innovations. There's other regions of the world uh, that are really racing ahead and there's major geopolitical implications of that and we should not uh, ignore them. Uh, I think of financial infrastructure and payments very much as critical infrastructure like 5G and others. Uh, so that I think is an important consideration when thinking about anything that relates to global payments. Um, I would also try to work closely with other institutions in the development of uh, identity standards and essentially identity protocols that can be not only privacy protecting, uh, but that can also support better KYC compliance and, and all of the things that go together with payments. Uh, if we do want to build eventually a global system for moving value, identity is going to be the key not only to financial inclusion but also reconciling what is often described as a trade-off uh, between compliance and privacy uh, again there's really interesting technology being built in this space and it would be really interesting to see um, governments um, you know building towards a better solution kyc is siloed within you know different banks and and, and often extremely ineffective um, the last point and and of course this is uh, closely related to how we're thinking about the problem is allow for competition, look at market structure and think about what, what is the comparative advantage of the central bank vis-a-vis -vis the private sector and, and groups of private sector participants uh, like the consortium uh, behind Libra and others. Um, you know, there, there's different capabilities and when it comes to building tech stack, uh, payment rails and, and overall software, uh, it is not clear to me that that's within the remit of, of the central bank. Uh, the central bank can do a fantastic job at developing the most safe uh, and secure final settlement layer. Uh, and of course, you know, uh, ensuring that it allows you to implement monetary policy and all the broader remit of, of, of a central bank. Uh, but the private sector, the private sector can, can actually accelerate ahead a number of applications across different industry verticals and applications. If you try to over-engineer CBDC, you will end up, you know, deploying it 10, 15 years from now. And by then, you know, some of these alternative payment systems uh, will be already in place. Uh, and, you know, we're seeing them uh, across the globe popping up together with, with other initiatives that, that governments have about, uh, you know, building infrastructure in, in other parts of, of the globe. Um, you know, what, so what do I mean by a public-private partnership on this is, uh, again, as we uh, stated many times, the only reason why, for example, we're running a Libra Reserve in the initial design is because we're waiting for the public sector to deploy a CBDC-like solution, and a wholesale CBDC would be perfect. Right now, you know, we're, we will be custodying essentially HQLAs with a bank, uh, and you can imagine us going from custodying those to custodying the wholesale CBDC exactly with the same bank custodian, in a way that doesn't alter the equilibrium on, you know, private money creation and the role that banks play uh, in the economy. Um, so we, we think there's a number of steps and experiments. I am a bit worried that when I look at some of the uh, proposals, they do ignore some of the upside here and, 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 and often ignore the opportunity cost of the status quo. The status quo is one that does not promote competition, does not promote interoperability. So my answer to what does a blockchain-based solution that starts permission add to the picture relative to a permissionless system, is very basic in economics, interoperability and the ability of a small player to interop interoperate fully with a larger one yeah. is extremely valuable to driving costs down, driving competition and innovation. That's what I hope to see. I agree. And you know what? I really believe that we are one. And therefore, what if we could imagine money that connects us all together, you know, without all these hurdles we currently have? So Kathleen, your turn to have the magic wand. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I think uh, Michael and, and Christian have already hit on some of the major themes, but yeah, more or less like um, find opportunities to promote experimentation. I, I think uh, fundamentally my project is grounded in the conceit that we don't exactly know what good digital money is going to look like. Um, and rather keeping an eye on what works in different systems is kind of the way to, to seed innovation. So again, in the spirit of like, talking my own book. Um, I do think that it, a, a, an open mind is kind of the way to approach this. I, th I think it's been um, 
interesting to watch some some jurisdictions try to uh, pick winners really early on, um, and uh, and I think that'll be at their folly. I think the most um, I think the most competitive and dynamic um, uh, regulatory entities will be the ones who try to consider from all points of view, you know, um, how this technology could be harbored. Um, I've also been in and around the space for about um, six years, and so I've seen a fair amount of fads come in and out. And um, oftentimes, the people who come in most confident uh, at the, the forefront of these uh, of these um, trials are the ones who um, are the ones who like, uh, in the end, betray a fundamental misunderstanding of whether it's finance, economics, or technology. And, and candidly, we're, we're merging all three very liberally, as well as game theory, as well as like computer security and cryptography. Like, um, this is an extremely multidisciplinary space, and um, and no one quite has the answer because, frankly, the industry didn't exist ten years ago, right? Um, so it's it's worth it's worth noting that um, when when trying to uh, establish like how confident you are in the truth value of you know one one um, statement or another, and that you know goes for every every. Uh, every single you know sort of initiative like a cbdc but in particular this since um so much is on the line potentially um so yeah just just uh be open to experimentation and, and find ways to promote that obviously within reason yeah fully agree you know when the internet was created if someone would have said to me that one day there was going to be an app that i would touch a button and i could speak to anybody in the world for free i would have said you're crazy and that's the point that today, where we stand today, we don't know where this is going to take us in terms of innovation. And that's why I just think that if we keep to the key principles, like Christian was talking about, that he talked about integrity, innovation, interoperability, caring for everybody we left behind, you know, making things right, then I think that together, Really, this is the internet. This is the world together. Without world gardens, we can create a better world for everybody. And finally, um, I'm going to leave it to Jacek, your magic one. All right. So I, I, I probably have to disclose that I've been a great fan of the work that ECB uh, has been doing in the space. I remember that one of my first uh, readings on cryptocurrency was their paper from 2012 uh, on I think back then it was called virtual currencies and then all the other publications until now, until the recent ones on stable coins uh, were just excellent. So, for example, if you want to learn about various stable coin models from the from the crypto space, read their papers. This just shows how excellent in terms of research these guys are. And I also fully agree with the current um, strategy of the ECB, which I'm reading as you know, we don't we don't want to like issue digital euro straight away, but we want to be prepared in case we have to. Uh, and I think that this is uh, very smart because they are. I think that they're allowing already, in terms of experimentation, in uh, at least internally. I think that the work is you know uh, going going full steam ahead within the ECB on various models. Uh, so I think that this is this all sounds great and very promising for uh, for the EU. Just in terms of like any advice, because that's your question, Monica, right? Um, I think that uh, the approach should be to really, you know, uh, I think that this is the right approach to have like sovereign money uh, and the, you know, it has to be privileged. This is the mandate of the ECB to, to you know, to get it done this way. Yet uh, the approach should be to allow uh, uh, innovation. So it's not about uh, allowing competition to central bank money to emerge, but rather to just allow innovation experimentation in Europe so that as, as, um, as the continent, as, as the region, we do not only compete uh, with China and the US uh, just with uh, you know, digital euro, no matter what kind of form it's gonna have, but also employ all the you know, private market uh, in order to develop the inno innovation that is on also going to be competitive against anything else that emerges elsewhere. Guys, I'm going to do this for you. Bravo, because you cannot hear everybody clapping, but I'm sure everybody would like to clap for you. You were fantastic. Thank you so much. I think we ran out of time, so um, we won't have any five minute break. We're going to go immediately into a fascinating uh, next panel. So Lucas, it's all yours. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to chair this amazing uh, group of people. Thank you. Thank you, it was a real pleasure.
Thank you so much, Monica. You have made it extremely difficult for me to follow up in your big footsteps as a moderator. It will be hard to pair your enthusiasm and professionalism and asking questions to the audience. Can I ask now the members of my distinguished panel on central bank digital currencies from the central banks to join me, please, Mr. Ulrich Binzeil, Mr. Yutaka Soyama of the Bank of Japan and Mr. Scott Hendry. Ulrich, hello. Scott, hello. Yutaka, it's good to see you. Hi. Hello. Hi. And good evening to Japan. I think, yes, Yutaka, uh, what is the time now in Japan? Yes. <laughs> it must be really late, I'm afraid. It must be around midnight. And Scott, for you, it's oh. the morning. So. <laughs> yes, good morning to all. Good morning to you, Scott. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining me. This is a real delight to moderate your panel today. I will start with uh, briefly introducing you. Then we will have uh, the opportunity to listen to Ulrich Binzel. He will give us a short upshot of the recent report of the European Central Bank about its intentions to uh, pilot, to test, and to go forward with the central bank digital currency. Thank you for making this presentation, Ulrich. You have heard that the industry is impressed by the work of the European Central Bank. Read these papers <laughs> from the European Central Banks. These guys know what they're doing, so we're in good hands, it seems. It was good to hear, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was good to hear that. And then after you have done your presentation, then we will open the floor and uh, I hope we will have an interesting and exciting discussion. So thank you again, everybody for joining. So Ulrich Binzeil is the Director General of the European Central Bank's Market Infrastructures and Payments Division. Since a year now, if I'm not mistaken, you have been Director General for Market Operations before, since 2012, and you headed the ECB's Risk Management Division before. So you have a very broad experience in the central bank, which puts you in a great position to work on central bank digital currencies. Your publications include publications on monetary policy operations, the financial system, central banking before 1800 and rehabilitation, a work that was published in 2019. Yutaka is head of the FinTech Center and deputy director general of payments in the Bank of Japan. He joined the bank in 1990 and mainly works in the research sections covering financial markets, bank supervision, macro prudence, financial engineering, risk management, payment and settlement systems. So also very broad area of activity, Yutaka. Some of your papers that you published have applied the state of the art technologies like network analysis, high frequency data, artificial intelligence, artificial markets, and text analysis for all of the bank's ongoing issues. You have engaged in the financial system report. You've written a report on market review and you did the Bank of Japan review. So you have an MA in economics from the University of Washington and a bachelor from Kyoto University. Very welcome to join us. Thank you, Yutaka. Uh, Scott, uh, welcome. Scott Henry was appointed the Senior Special Director of Financial Technology of FinTech, as we say in brief in the funds management and banking department of the Bank of Canada in June 2016, so four years ago. And in your role, you oversee the bank's efforts to monitor and research developments and implementations of new technologies affecting the financial sector. And this includes also research and conducting research on the possibility of creating and introducing a central bank digital currency. Uh, your research has been focused on central bank digital currency, electronic money, price discovery in the Canadian government bond market, and central bank communication. You hold a PhD in economics from the University of Western Ontario. So welcome as well, Scott. Thank you so much. Ulrich, without much further ado, I would ask you to give your introductory presentation on the very recent report, which the European Central Bank has published on the 2nd of October. So it's, it's brand new. Everybody's talking about it. And it sets out the way forward, how the European Central Bank would like to test and to experiment with central bank digital currencies and take a decision whether or not to introduce one in the euro area. Ulrich, the floor is yours. Thank you very much.
Uh, yeah. So thank you, Lucas. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me to this event. I really enjoyed the uh, the previous panels. It was really good to listen to. So uh, as you mentioned, I mean, the ECB has been coming out with its uh, maybe long-awaited uh, report on um, a digital euro. And um, sorry, let me just close this one. Um, sorry, sorry. Um, and this was on, on 2nd of October. And, and so I will briefly present the key messages of this report. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I don't know if I need to define digital euro central bank money made available to citizens and firms in digital form for use in payments. And three messages have been emphasized in the report. First, it would uh, complement existing forms of central bank money, and it would not aim at uh, substituting, replacing them. So in particular, the, uh, the end of uh, cash, the end of banknotes is, uh, is a topic that uh, is sometimes associated with introduction of CBDC, but uh, we, we don't see it this way. We will continue issuing uh, cash without time limitation. And I think there we are in line with, uh, with all other uh, central banks uh, who have who are communicating on this. So CBDC is not a mean to uh, discontinue cash and overcome the zero lower bound or, or, or things like that. Um, the report emphasizes the synergies uh, with the industry. So the industry, as has been mentioned in the previous panel, and I fully agree, is uh, innovative and diverse and can create a lot of additional services that the central bank should not aim at covering. The uh, central bank should not see this uh, as uh, competing with its own services, but should embrace it and should uh, go for those synergies and the complementarities. And then the report says the digital euro hasn't been really necessary so far, but there are scenarios where it becomes necessary and those scenarios could materialize relatively quickly. And uh, as uh, the project takes uh, some time, better, better start moving to be ready to switch uh, that on once uh, the scenarios have materialized. And, uh, and Ricky Lamberti mentioned that I would have said yesterday it takes five to 10 years. I don't remember having said 10 years. I think five years is a kind of order of magnitude one, one could imagine. 10 years would, would sound maybe uh, pretty, pretty long. Um, yeah, what, what would be the main benefits of a digital euro according to the report, I mean, obviously, it could uh, support digitalization in the European economy. You could say uh, banknotes uh, is a technology, if you want, from the 18th century. It hasn't really changed the way we, we pay with, uh, with cash now. So you could say the world has changed so much. Digitalization is transforming societies. And it would be strange if the central bank with its main product uh, would uh, would not follow this uh, and and support the economic digitalization as a whole uh, through a, a means of payment. Uh, you could also formulate the same thing in a more reactive way. Maybe if uh, the use of cash is declining, so even if central banks continue issuing cash without time limitation, the use of cash can decline to an extent that cash becomes unusable because let's say shops do no longer want to accept it. You can of course uh, fight against that through uh, legal measures, that's possible, okay. But um, assume still people just don't use cash any longer, then um, you would basically lose or people would lose eventually if cash is no longer usable because of that, the ability to pay in central bank money and to have central bank money as a fallback solution uh, for payments. And, uh, and payment markets, you know, payment is a network industry. We easily have a high degree of concentration you know, of the industry. So the availability of a public uh, sector solution as a fallback is uh, good for competition and good for, let's say, protecting citizens from uh, the power of a few companies which could dominate this market. And we see 
a trend of market concentration in this industry. Um, the digital payment, private payments, which is quite impressive and competition there is of course welcome, but availability of uh, digital central bank money is a fallback solution, which is in any case good for the citizen. And then third, uh, maybe that's a bit specific to Europe, tackling sovereignty concerns related to, maybe that's a bit overemphasized here, foreign CBDC, or maybe more private digital means of payments in the Euro area. Foreign CBDC, which would uh, be used in the Euro area is, uh, is, is, a, is an issue for the future to be seen. But of course, uh, private digital means of payment in the Euro area, those uh, players with uh, market power are typically um, subsidiaries from uh, foreign companies, also in the e-commerce space. Those companies uh, are very successful. I mean, they have contributed to um, easy uh, payments. So they are very um, successful companies, but nevertheless, um, when the degree, let's say, of market uh, dominance of, uh, of foreign players gets uh, very high, that is an issue for, for monetary sovereignty, where, of course, we encourage also European players to be successful, to regain market share, to add to competition and sovereignty. But uh, domestic CBDC would, of course, contribute here in a very effective uh, manner as well to keep sovereignty of payments, in particular if uh, cash usage goes uh, down. So this is again, you know, a kind of uh, textbook slide uh, saying what uh, CBDC is against other forms of money. So three different forms of money. Central bank money is the liability of the central bank. And with CBDC, we combine the features of cash and deposits of banks with the central bank, this, the two existing forms of central bank money. We combine the general access that we have now for cash with the digital form, which we have only now for deposits that banks can hold with the central bank. So the combination of two is a digital euro. Liability of a private entity, you can distinguish commercial bank money, of course, e-money and stable coins also tend to fall in this uh, category. So if you hold um, a stable coin, you have a claim against an identifiable entity and you have uh, some sort of uh, convertibility promise um, of your uh, claim into central bank money or commercial bank money, which itself is convertible into central bank money. And of course, crypto assets very different or form, a form of uh, digital, digital commodity, which uh, has no stable value in terms of the unit of account and which is uh, not the liability of anyone. Um, okay, again, the digital euro should be a complement to private initiatives and private initiatives should not feel um, to be threatened, to be crowded out by a digital euro. First, uh, the payment market is an enormous one, no? So uh, easily you support a different means of payments, which can to some extent compete. There's uh, enough space. It's a gigantic market. It's a growing market. And in particular, in the scenario where cash payments at the point of sales would further decline, and that would be, let's say, accompanied by the central bank entering the digital payment sphere, you could say the central bank brings with it its own volumes. It brings with it the volumes that were previously in, uh, in cash payments into the digital payment space. Second, you know, private sector will always remain more innovative and that's how we want it to be. And uh, there's no comparative advantage of the central bank trying to be as innovative and, and as providing so many different various services as the private sector can do. And the central banks have no ambition to take up the front end of CBDC, of course, to be seen in, in the details, but many of uh, the services that you need to do, like customer identification um, or AML, CTF, uh, monitoring those things, um, you know, where you need some capacity. Ideally, you could rely here on synergies of uh, payment system providers doing that, this anyway. 
and maybe integrate CBDC into front ends that will be provided by the private sector to be seen, to be developed, but that uh, should probably be the direction. Um, and also important, the central banks, at least the ECB, has no ambition to um, see its balance sheet balloon at the expense of commercial banks by seeing a lot of side deposits now held with commercial banks to migrate to into CBDC. So there's some mechanism has to be built in into CBDC to not make the central bank a large um, investment vehicle for the economy, because again, we have no comparative advantage in this. What you collect as deposits, you have to match with some assets and the central bank should not be keen to massively invest into, let's say, information intensive or credit risky assets. The private sector is better in that. Um, and yeah, so this um, that's again relating also to the front end. CBDC would be offered preferably through supervised uh, service providers to achieve those uh, synergies. Um, supervised service providers, I mean, supervised entities typically are well defined and they are supervised. So it is, uh, of, of course, an obvious choice to, uh, to start from an existing category of, uh, of such providers. Um, so what, how would the digital euro look like? That's, uh, that's a question that, uh, that the man on the street or the woman on the street will, will ask, you know, what is this? So the answer is probably it can look like any modern payment solution for a point of sale or online payments for the citizen. So you can imagine it being integrated into existing solutions. It can be a card, it can be a non-line um, computer uh, internet access, and it can uh, be included in mobile uh, applications for payments as we know them. Uh, it would obviously be made available through the entire Euro area. The more interesting question is, to what extent would it be available outside the Euro area, which uh, has to be you know, further discussed. Then uh, it, would, it should serve the entire uh, population and also help um, to curtail financial exclusion of the unbanked, um, which of course is uh, across the globe, you know, an, uh, an issue of not equal importance. We have a very high degree of, uh, let's say, financial inclusion in the euro area. But nevertheless, I think in view of the inclusiveness of cash, of banknotes, we would have similar requirements here. But you enter a lot of interesting questions not only that uh, maybe the reliance on uh, existing account relationships uh, with uh, banks doesn't work, but also, you know, you need at least an electronic device probably. So to be uh, worked on, to be uh, kept in, in mind in, uh, in developing the digital euro. Then privacy yeah, is an important topic. Um, I mean, there where AML CTF comes into play, the ECB, you know, is of course, will of course um, apply all the existing regulation. I mean, the ECB is not the legislator, it will not invent this, it will apply it. And, uh, and that will of course uh, play a role also for defining, you know, privacy, maybe thresholds, size thresholds for payments, and then also for data uh, conservation and data storage. So. There, there are many interesting uh, questions here. In any case, of course, the central bank has no business model to um, you know, make use of payment data for commercial purposes. That, of course, distinguishes it from, uh, from maybe other providers, private providers. It's by definition risk-free central bank money, even if it is offered via intermediaries. And um, yeah, it should be free of charge for basic uses by payers in the same way as uh, banknotes are. And, and of course here, you know, in a very stylized form, the question account-based versus what we call now bearer-based in our report. So is there a kind of uh, yeah, central ledger which, uh, which books uh, the transactions or not? And other question, um, is it not, let's say, related but not identical question? 
do we allow for offline uh, payments? I mean, cash can be used uh, offline. I mean, we are now rarely offline. Maybe we want to be offline, but we are rarely offline. But maybe we still want, nevertheless, to, to be able to pay offline. So those are interesting questions then uh, for the technology to be looked at. Here on the account base side, we put uh, as a, let's say, uh, thought, um, e.g. Uh, TIPS. TIPS is our instant payment system uh, where you can pay uh, 24 hours, seven days a week. Uh, it's an NINST compliant uh, payment um, solution where, you know, currently everybody can, or provided the banks offer instant payment, can make now uh, SEPA inst payments to anyone who also has a bank uh, which offers inst payments. Um, we still have some interoperability problems which should be solved uh, at the end of next year. Uh, and in theory, you know, you could imagine that uh, tips uh, could be open to um, to yeah, end customers. Uh, so to have uh, accounts, basically tips accounts for um, for citizens instead of ha having tips accounts uh, for banks. So now tips is still part of a two layer system. So it settles immediately the transactions of the account holder, but it's set it in um, for the account for the for the citizen, it's settled in commercial bank money, and it's settled in central bank money for the banks, but not for the um, for the citizen. And that, in theory, could be changed. It's just one possible technical idea how to offer um, digital euro, and that would be obviously an account-based system. Um, maybe just to say one one last word. Yeah, we have heard a lot about um, let's say DLT. Uh, based solution and uh, and programmable euro i mean of course that that um, can be foreseen in one way or the other so maybe uh, even if one moves to an account based system that wouldn't exclude you know that you also have um, uh, let's say one channel of um, of uh, bira based um, tokenized um, cbdc that would be uh, open then to let's say, programmable money uses. So that really has to be uh, studied, but uh, a hybrid system with, let's say, different approaches can also be imagined. Of course, as someone, I think Christian Catalini was saying, we should not over-engineer, we should also move on and have this project, once we launch it, deliver a solution in a foreseeable uh, point of time. So there's a trade-off, of course, um, between uh, the the set of uh, of things we offer um, in the in the first let's say uh, instance, um, but so yeah, there are trade-offs. We have to look at it. But uh, what will be crucial for all that will be um, the next uh, phase also. So we need to do um, further conceptual analysis. You know, impact on uh, monetary policy on the financial systems. Um, we have to study design feature. I mentioned those points, technology, and what we want to do, you know, to enrich our um, understanding of uh, needs and possible solutions. We have launched a public consultation on the 12th of October. That is, um, and, and it has a three months duration. So uh, answers please by 11th of January midnight. And uh, there's a series of questions. Some are more directed to citizens. Others are more directed to um, professionals, to even technology companies, market participants of all kind, public authorities. Everybody can answer to everything. But um, you will see, you know, it's, uh, it's, of course, depending on where you come from, where you will spend most energy. And in any case, you know, um, Please also send us, you know, whatever um, additional documentation you want. Yeah, so um, send us attachments, whatever you know. Explain to us every input is appreciated. And uh, listening to the previous panels, I see there are a lot of ideas there. So even you know, coming with uh, technical solutions, how to link, um, 
how to link, let's say, the private innovative uh, payment industry into a CBDC is uh, highly appreciated. Um, we also have some international coordination work. We are a part of a group in Basel of seven central banks uh, which are studying CBDC. I mean, to keep in mind at an early stage interoperability and also maybe international cross usage issues. Um, yeah, we will also, you know, continue practical experimentation that has also been mentioned in the previous uh, panel. I mean, we have to get our hands uh, dirty uh, with experimentation. That will still be maybe relatively small scale experimentation, internal experimentation. So not yet, um, you know, deployment to uh, citizens in the experimentation, at least not at a large scale. Uh, and then the big question is at the end, um, whether to launch a project or not. So in mid 2021, the Euro system will consider whether to launch a project. And a project means basically you spend, you really spend money to prepare a viable product, a minimum viable product at least, uh, that could then be used. I mean, it, it's not a decision to issue the uh, CBDC. Um, if we, let's say, take optimistic, you know, or whatever optimistic or realistic assumptions, such a project yeah, could last a few years. And, uh, and then whenever, you know, you really take the decision to issue that, the more advanced you are in your project, the better, of course. Okay, I think that's uh, all I wanted to say. This is just, again, the links and the QR code to our publications. Thank you, Lucas. You are, you are muted. Thank you, Ulrich. I was just saying this was a very clear and very helpful presentation. So if we try to put this a little bit into context, uh, central banks, around 80% of central banks we heard in the beginning of, of the day, are today experimenting with central bank digital currencies in one form or another. And if we look back a little bit uh, to 2015 to 2016, the emphasis on these experiments was on wholesale banking solutions. So Monica has explained this already, if this basic difference between wholesale and retail solutions and in the wholesale solutions were essentially improvements to the way that payments between banks are settled on the interbank market. And now suddenly we see this emergence uh, this report of the European Central Bank that says we want to look also into the possibility of general purpose CBDCs, CBDCs, central bank digital currencies that can be used by the general public, which is a completely different ball game, which is more potentially disruptive, but also more innovative and allows for a lot of financial services to be built on top. So um, I would I would perhaps like to, to start with a question then um, uh, to Yutaka, if you allow me. Yutaka, um, if we look at the Bank of uh, Japan's uh, development the last years, you also had uh, a very interesting cooperation with the European Central Bank on a wholesale CBDC that was Project Stella. And very recently, the Bank of Japan has published its intention to go forward with uh, proof of concepts and pilots to test also a general CBDC. Can you explain us in a few words what has motivated uh, the Bank of Japan to take this step and to go forward to testing also general purpose CBDC and having listened to what you heard before from the, uh, from the companies on the need for a central bank digital currency. What, what is it that motivates Japan? Is it similar business cases that you see? Is it a fear to lose control of a monetary sovereignty? What is it that has made you take this step, Yutaka? Thank you. Um, the, the Bank of Japan uh, released the uh, stance paper on the, the CBDC. And the first part of the, the, uh, the stance paper explained the, the uh, three major uh, role of the, the uh, CBDC, including the, the potential uh, function. The first is to uh, complement the cash. If the cash circulation will significantly decline, and if this is a second condition, 
and the private digital money would not substitute for the malfunctioning cash systems. So Japan is far from such a circumstance, and so we do not prepare for the, the issuing uh, CBDC. But however, uh, we have been investigating the, the CBDC. Uh, the good example is the, the Astera project with the ECB, but uh, the, that's project mainly focusing on the, the wholesale CBDC to replicate the, the, uh, the BOJ network or uh, the uh, uh, replicating the, the, uh, the, uh, the derivative assets payment function. Um, but the, um, the, uh, we, uh, now we uh, still are continue to investigate the, the uh, CBDC because the, we pay attention to the potential of digital uh, money like uh, the CBDC and private digital money. The stance paper proposed the second motivation of the CDBC, that is the supporting uh, private payment services. The payment services need a payment measure the in modern financial system, the commercial bank deposit play a most important role as a payment measure. The theoretically speaking, the money is a transferable debt. The social anthropology study suggests the money was born as an uh, information system to manage the debt and claim, supported by trust in the ancient society. Uh, there is a broad consensus that the commodity money, like a gold ingot, are not the origin of the money. So bank deposit your money as a dead and it is transferable, that is the point. But the bank A's dead is not compatible with bank B's dead. Therefore, we need the declaring system and the central bank deposit account to settle the transaction across the bank. This is unavoidable uh, situation because the bank deposit uh, have another important function that is credit creation the financial intermediation. In contrast, the central bank debt is a single solo debt in the nation. The people use the cash as a real time debt clearing measure. When I buy uh, any goods, I owe debt to the seller. So cash is the best way to clear the debt uh, at the instance and with finality. The CBDC is a digital a central bank debt and an, uh, Unicity of the debt is, uh, has an advantage to overcome the weak point of the isolated and diversified money that is, uh, that is incompatible debt issued by different entity, different commercial banks. So good example is the current situation in uh, the Japan's uh, cashless payment uh, businesses. Many non-bank payment services jump in the market and they issue their own debt in place of the prepaid money. So they cannot access the clearing house for bank and they do not have uh, the current account in the central bank. So given the, such a condition, the two tiered money system become the three tiered. The so deeper tiered system requires the, the larger uh, cost. So CBDC is the solution uh, for a fragmented money system. The key point is CBDC is a measure of the payment. It is not uh, the payment services. So we have to distinguish from the, the uh, payment, uh, uh, distinguish the payment measure from the payment services. The payment service and the financial innovation uh, uh, innovator can use the CBDC for their new payment business model. This is the second motivation to issue the CBDC. That is a support uh, for better uh, private uh, payment services. The third one, uh, third motivation or third potential of the CBDC go beyond the payment services as well as financial services. The CBDC and its uh, infrastructure can stimulate and accelerate emergence of new business uh, model in digital economy. In the real opportunity of it is a real opportunity of digital money. Uh, for the purpose, the, the money system should be open, but controlled for a secured privacy uh, of individual and firms. We don't have a clear uh, image how the second and the third, the potential will realize in near future. If the demand for such a potential, uh, potentials uh, in future, we can confirm uh, the rationale uh, to move forward. 
I think the hand-on exercise uh, to investigate the CBDC design and share uh, our trial with the private sector is the best way to discover uh, the potential use case. So we plan a two stage of the POC uh, to explore CBDC design, both in institutional setup and uh, the IT systems. While we do not have the uh, plan to issue the CBDC now, we will explore CBDC opportunity in the digital age. So that is kind of the, uh, our stance for the CBDC. Thank you very much. So it's three reasons, sub solution to the fragmented commercial banking system, second support for better private services, private payment services, and the third reason to support new business models as we have heard in the morning as well. Thank you very much. Scott, turning to Canada, uh, you have also done a very interesting series of tests in 2016, if I'm not mistaken, Project Jasper. Uh, can you share with us a little bit your experience in Canada and what would drive the Bank of Canada to take this step and, and develop and get serious about developing a general purpose CBDC? Is this something that's still far on the horizon for you in Canada or something that's coming closer? Yeah, we went through a, a similar exercise to what uh, the Bank of Japan and the, the ECB did with Project uh, Jasper in, in uh, our own project. Uh, no, they install us in Jasper. So it was primarily designed to teach us about what blockchain is, to investigate the technology and to see uh, how it worked. Uh, and we picked a use case that we knew well, which was, of course, interbank payments. So we wanted to look at it in that wholesale market. Not because we thought that the current system uh, worked poorly, but more just simply because we wanted to understand the technology. And we were using it more as a lesson for uh, to understand the technology and how it would work in the, in the general environment for more of a retail use case. So could it be applied more broadly? So even before that, we were already looking at uh, the possibility of a retail CBDC. And back in February of this year, we issued our own document, similar to what the ECB just did, uh, looking at the retail uh, CBDC use case and what would motivate a central bank to, to uh, get into this area and issue a, a digital currency. So we put out a, a discussion of, of the different motivations and uh, announced that we were moving from a research phase to uh, something, again, similar to what the ECB announced, uh, contingency planning. So preparing for the contingency that at some point in the future, we may actually decide that it is important to, uh, to issue a CBDC in Canada. So the, the conditions don't currently exist, but at some point in the future, either through declining use of cash uh, and the disappearance of cash from the marketplace, or the introduction and widespread adoption of a foreign CBDC or private digital currency, or uh, a need to uh, issue something to support a digital economy, a, a digital uh, marketplace, uh, as we heard in, in the first panel this morning. So there's different motivations that might come up in the future. Uh, they, they, those conditions don't exist now, but we need to prepare for them. I don't know exactly whether it's gonna be the five years or the 10 years, that it would take to prepare a good robust system, but it's gonna take a lot of work. And we need to make sure we start early to be able to be ready when uh, it's decided that the, that the conditions do actually exist. And there's, there's many different motivations for, for a CBDC. Uh, and, but the perspective we've been taking is just to think about it very fundamentally about what does the central bank bring to the game? Uh, most of the money that's already in our economy is digital. Uh, physical cash is only a small portion of, of money. Uh, recently, Canadian transactions were down to about only a third of point of sale transactions were done using cash. Uh, the pandemic has probably lowered it further than that. The, the trend is likely to continue. Uh, so most money and payments are done digitally. So the question is, what is needed from the central bank? What does the central bank bring? And it, it's it's a number of different things. Uh, uh, most importantly, of course, it's access to a risk-free payment instrument. Uh, commercial bank money, uh, there's a lot of infrastructure around trying to reduce risk in that money. But in the end, uh, the only truly risk-free money is the commercial bank money. And we need to make sure that there is universal access to that. 
So we need to make sure that uh, not only do we promote financial inclusion, but we don't, uh, in allowing cash to disappear, uh, as it might, uh, promote financial exclusion. We need to make sure that everybody has access to uh, good, safe payment instruments. Uh, and maybe uh, necessary for the central bank to get involved to ensure that happens. There's good motivations around uh, uh, privacy. Cash is an extremely private payment instrument. If that is disappearing, then that level of privacy is disappearing as well. And, and what can the central bank do to, to make sure that continues? Like we, we're not going to actively remove cash, uh, the same as the, uh, the ECB was, was uh, arguing. Uh, but the trend is that it is declining. So we need to uh, understand what the implications are going to be. Uh, cash provides a competitive alternative to private sector payments. Uh, and a CBDC could similarly provide that, uh, that alternative. The private sector is uh, profit motivated and the central bank is not. So those, that means uh, has some important implications for the behavior and the type of money that, that is issued. And uh, uh, of course, monetary sovereignty is an important issue. So that if people start using a different unit of account, then uh, the power of monetary policy is, is uh, disappears. So if we want a Canadian monetary policy and we believe that it has been helpful in many circumstances uh, historically, then, uh, then we need people using the Canadian dollar. So we right. need to make sure that Canadian payment systems are the best they can be. So we've done a lot of work to make sure that we help uh, the private sector modernize their payments infrastructure. So there's uh, in both the wholesale and uh, existing retail levels, but we also need to think about whether a CBDC fits into that landscape as well. And very good, that. thank you very much, Scott. Um, we have 36 questions here in the in the chat room, and I would like to to pick out a few that that touch upon monetary sovereignty, a key word that you just used uh, a few seconds ago. Uh, we have heard from Libra uh, that they're not conceiving the stable coin as something that is to challenge a fiat currency. And I think they're realistic in, in, in assessing their capabilities to compete with, with uh, fiat currencies. Uh, but still, the notion has come up that uh, global stable coins like Libra challenge the sovereign uh, the sovereignty of central banks to decide about the money in, in, in circulation. So I would like to drill down a little bit better into this concern. Would you, would you discard this as something that is anyway uh, a, a false argument or should people take this seriously that private money can displace public money, can take its place and can take away the sovereignty of nations to decide about their, their fiat currency? Or on the other hand, would you say, no, this is uh, what Libra says is, is very plausible. We should cooperate. We should go for a hybrid model. We should take care of the reserves of the Libra coin and, and or, or allow wholesale banks to do this and uh, and let's work together and ensure that this is a com uh, a system that can, can accommodate both Libra and the central bank digital currency at the same time. What is your take on this uh, monetary sovereignty uh, concern? Perhaps uh, I would now start with Ulrich and then we'll go back the other order. Ulrich, if you would like to say a few words, we don't have a lot of time, but a few words yeah, about monetary Thanks, sovereignty. because I'm very short. No, I, <clears throat> I listened to Christian, you know, in the previous panel. And um, I mean, he also advocated competition. He was saying, you know, we bring in competition, the particular, the cross-border market lacks competition, etc. But of course, um, Libra, you know, the guys behind Libra are very big players, no? They have extreme power behind. So um, although when they enter the market, they, they add competition, I mean, they're a potential dominant player as well. So um, it's, and, and, you know, they are not a charity. They are, like the companies behind um, Libra are there to make profit now. So um, I, I'm not sure whether in equilibrium, we then have a more competitive situation with a more, you know, <laughs> monetary sovereignty when 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 this company have su has successfully entered the market with uh, its client base no with, with with its potential client base let's say so that's that's a bit the issue so um 
I would say a collaboration with uh, private entities who could also rely on central bank digital currency is especially a good idea. But let's say competition and sovereignty issues remain in the sense that we wouldn't, you know, want to be uh, dependent on a, a few uh, very powerful foreign um, or foreign, whatever, <laughs> how to define it, uh, companies. I think that uh, that concern, you know, remains or some central banks would say becomes uh, even more intense when someone like, like Libra wants to enter this market in addition. Very good. Thank you. Yutaka, would you like to make a short statement on monetary uh, sovereignty? Uh, Is this of concern for Japan? Um, I think that the, uh, some argue that the uh, private stable coin uh, uh, retail businesses uh, can harm the monetary sovereignty. But I think that the, at least in Japan, I do not have the, such an image because the Japan is an island nation. The tourism industry is getting bigger and foreign worker make a limitance market, limitance market larger. But they are uh, quite smaller than the trade and the investment value. The choice of currency for trade settlement is a primal uh, fundamental factor for the hegemony of currency. The funding for trade settlement uh, developed the financial markets and the growing up of the, the market lead, lead, lead to the development of financial investment. In the process of globalization of trade and finance, the currency hegemony does matter. For example, the, uh, the constraint of the balance of payment uh, limits uh, the monetary policy in Japan, especially in the, the high growth era uh, over the 40 years ago. And the original sin in growing Asian economy is still a source of financial instability. However, in ordinary uh, people's life in Japan, the majority of people uh, do not have the, the uh, incentive to hold the foreign currency denominated asset apart from the poten uh, personal invest investment. The, even for the stable coin linked to the value of the le uh, legal tender, it seemed to very difficult to obtain a broader user. In Japan, the competition of the cashless payment services is quite tough. The retail payment business is typical case of the two-sided market for user side and the merchant side. Generally speaking, the price elasticity of the demand in user side is higher than merchant side. So price uh, discount for users uh, side is higher than merchant. The marketing uh, campaign for user uh, has been overheated uh, in Japan with very large uh, payback using the point services. The point system is very interesting. It works uh, like a, a deposit and it is uh, issued as a uh, payment service as dead and convertible to other form of the money, including the deposit. The campaign for the merchant side is also overheating, for example, some payment service provider do not charge acquiring fee for fixed period. So they do not have any source of the income. Naturally, the, the business model uh, marks that they are a large deficit, uh, but they do not stop the tough competition in order to uh, obtain the big customers pool in user side and the merchant side. So the pool of the, the, uh, the user become the source of their other businesses, other business line in their ecosystem. They fight in the multiple two-sided uh, market with common pool of uh, the, uh, the payment services user. So I think that Libra uh, will hesitate to join such a red ocean market. <laughs> it's quite tough market. <laughs> and advertisement uh, businesses, that is uh, the background businesses of Libra's uh, the parents company, uh, but it is not uh, enough uh, to survive in such a severe total war. <laughs> <laughs> Very good, excellent. Yeah. Scott, what is, what is your take? We heard two slightly different views. I think Ulrich said, yeah, well, Libra, of course, adds competition, but Libra is backed by big players and big players, you know, in particular platforms that already have a monopoly position might tend to also go for monopoly position in payments. Then we heard Japan, I think it was a, a, a viewpoint uh, 
based on the situation of card payments where card users get large kickbacks and loyalties uh, fees for using credit cards. So it's a very competitive market it will be hard for a digital coin to grab market shares. How do you see the situation in, in Canada? Any concerns about monetary sovereignty? Uh, depends on what, how you want to define concerns. Uh, I typically view this as a low probability but catastrophic event. So if people leave the Canadian dollar and go elsewhere, as I said, it's, it's uh, extremely difficult and impossible to do monetary policy. So it could be a very significant concern. But there has to be really serious reasons why people would go to a different unit of account. Uh, and that would only tend to happen if things were really going wrong. So as long as we are doing good macro policy in Canada, there's really limited reason for people to be looking elsewhere. Uh, these efficiency gains that are possible in the type of payments that Libra is after probably means it's not going to take over uh, a huge part of the, uh, the payments landscape. But I think there's two questions you need to look at when thinking about this. First of all is, uh, is the stable coin uh, being offered in your domestic unit of account? And similarly, um, is the institution regulated? So if the institution is regulated and that we've improved the structure so that they're well regulated, there really isn't that much difference between a stable coin uh, such as Libra or some other entities and commercial bank money. It's a uh, private sector digital payment instrument that's backed by assets. We, we have a lot of knowledge about how to deal with that. The structure of a stable coin is different. The technology is supposed to be irrelevant. Our regulations are supposed to be technology agnostic. So uh, we, can, we can deal with it um, with modifications so that it can be offered in, a, in, a, in a, a safe manner. So if it's being offered in your domestic unit of account, it's just a different type of money, not that separate from what we've already got available to us. So from a monetary sovereignty perspective, it's not a risk. But that said, Libra is only targeting a few currencies at this point. Eventually, they might have, what is it, 180 or plus currencies uh, that are around the world. They might have all those. But at the start, uh, the US, the Euro, and the, um, the Yen could be, could be there, and they wouldn't have to worry because it's in their unit of account but chances are they're not going to offer a Canadian dollar. And there's certainly all sorts of other currencies they wouldn't offer. So by the time they get to the point of maybe offering that currency, those economies could be liberalized. And that would come with uh, serious problems. So it really depends on where you are, how you should view the risks of something like Libra. Is it in your unit of account or not? Uh, that was the biggest worry of all countries when in uh, Libra 1.0 they were talking about a multiple currency version so that it was in nobody's unit of account. So even the large economies were facing um, something that was being offered that would take their people uh, into a different money that could affect their monetary sovereignty. These single currency versions uh, can fit regulation much better and pose less of a monetary sovereign risk, but it's not necessarily going to serve everybody in the same way. This is very interesting. So it would matter depending on whether Libra is issued as a Canadian dollar or not, obviously. Simply the use of the Libra in Canada would not make an impact as such, but if it would be pegged to the Canadian dollar, it would be less of an impact than if it would be a Libra, for instance, pegged to the US dollar, would be a US dollar Libra. That could have a displacement effect for the use of the Canadian dollar. Is this, do I understand you right? Yeah, so if, if there's a US dollar CBDC, right. and a US dollar Libra, um, the implications for Canada are basically the same. Uh, it it's, would potentially lead to the dollarization of the Canadian economy. Right. Uh, so uh, we would have to look at the motivations underlying why people would want to use these alternative currencies and figure out what can be done in Canada to motivate them uh, to stay in the Canadian dollar. So is it a problem with um, efficiency of the current uh, domestic payment systems? 
Uh, is it, uh, are they being bribed to buy points and other things to move elsewhere? Is it part of um, uh, so the, just the social media platform that the, the platform that's offering it has other things attached to it that, that just aren't available in Canada? You really have to understand the motivations to be able to figure out what's the best response. A CBDC might not be the best response. Uh, there could be other, they're probably going to need all sorts of responses to keep people using the domestic uh, monetary um, uh, unit of account. Very good. Uh, looking at time, I think we have time for one last round of questions and then we, we should break up. I see that we got a lot of questions about the question of using CBDCs across borders, cross-border interoperability. There was a question about issuing a global decentralized bank digital currency. So I would like to summarize this perhaps in the following way. We have seen that seven banks are working closely together in the Basel group in discussing different possibilities for central bank digital currency. You are sitting together from time to time. What does this mean? You're exchanging your views that you're doing proofs of concept. So does this mean that you're also talking about what would be the standards if we wanted to achieve interoperability between our CBDCs. So in doing your pilots, is this something that is being taken into account in Japan, in, 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 in Europe or in Canada? Are you, are you having interoperability and issuing an interoperable system of digital fiat currencies on your mind? Last question and quick answers, and then we will break up. I think we're all tired. <laughs> Um, yeah, who would like to start? Ulrich, you take the floor. Yeah, okay. I see yeah. your screen. You made the first move, the first noise, so the camera zooms in on you. So this is for okay. you. Okay, good. good. There you go. No, uh, I would say, I mean, we are we are not in a very advanced stage, you know, because all the, those seven central banks, I mean, they are at a different stage, but most of them are not, you know, in an advanced stage. Take the ECB as an example. So if we talk on interoperability. I mean, we are, we are not yet there, you know, to, to even articulate our own standards. But uh, I mean, we acknowledge that this should be kept in mind and moving on, the work will become more concrete. The question is, of course, what means interoperable exactly? So it could mean that uh, you want to allow for cross-currency um, international um, payments, no? So where you build in a, a cross-currency layer, um, that's that's one one thing. And uh, by the way, we are experimenting on that um, now, or we are analyzing this uh, with uh, together with the Swedes. You know, the Swedes uh, have taken uh, tips as uh, as instant payment system. So there we have an ideal, you know, uh, experimentation for cross currency. We will see if we can do it there. You need, of course, to have also um, addressable accounts now in the other currency. So you need some standard like the SEPA standard in Europe. So there are lots of questions, but that could be the meaning of interoperable. Another meaning could be that, you know, some connections that you offer interfaces that you offer to the private sector could be similar so that, you know, let's say a global bank which wants to connect to different CBDCs can use a similar interface, no? and doesn't have to have different ones. So it can mean different things. It's on the radar screen, but it's not, you know, that is it is already concretely worked out because at least ECB is in a too early stage. It's early days still. Okay, yeah. very good. Yutaka, what is your view on interoperability and global yeah. solutions? Uh, the, I and the Bank of Japan has a strong interest on the, the, uh, the cross-border, uh, the new payment measure. And the, uh, the institutional, uh, the setup for the, ins, uh, the interoperability it's not enough for the, the uh, cross-border system because uh, the one central bank is dead definitely differ from the other central bank dead. So uh, the new system requires the, the swap of the CBDCs or any pool of the CBDC in the system. And I think that it's quite high hard uh, to share the, the, the CBDC uh, between the, the two banks or multiple bank. That is a quite high hard for the, the new idea. Okay, thank you very much. Scott, you have the last word. <laughs> yeah, this is a, a very important use case uh, that needs to be uh, thought about. But at the same time, I think the domestic use cases are much more important. We have to get something uh, in the form of a CBDC right uh, to serve the domestic economy uh, and then figure out uh, how it would uh, work internationally as well. That said, 
we do have to keep in mind that that is a, a long run uh, use case and goal. So we can't uh, completely separate out this work. And we need to keep in mind uh, what the implications are of all of our choices at a domestic level so that we can, uh, we don't close any doors to make sure that we um, can have something that's interoperable at some point in the future. Uh, so we are keeping this as part of our discussions, but the, it is not the main part of our discussions uh, at this point. Very good, because it's still early days, so we first have to figure out where to use the central bank digital currency in the first place. Thank you so much for your participation to all participants, to all speakers, for the 200 listeners who have been loyally staying with us for the last hours. This has been a very exciting journey, starting from the industry perspectives to stablecoin and technology providers and central bankers. Thank you so much. Have a good remainder of the day. Thank you to Japan. Sleep well, Yutaka, and uh, have a good day uh, to Scott in Canada, where the day has just started. Thank you so much, and talk to you hopefully another time. Goodbye. <laughs>